Shirt Show. All right, let's go. Shirt Show! Shirt Show! Shirt Show! Shirt Show! Shirt Show! Shirt Show! All right, episode 65 of Shirt Show. We're talking with Allison from Parkway Print Shop in Virginia. Let's go! Hey, boo. Hey, baby bear. Hey. Hey. Check. Check. Hey there. I love you. Does <laughs> it work? Uh, yeah, love you. Are you love picking you up too. what I'm putting down? Mm-hmm. You look smart. Thanks. Once again. Once again. Um, so, how was Atlantic City? Uh, it was Atlantic City. Um, so, really clean. And mm-hmm. really popping. Yeah. So pretty much we got word from a bunch of people that before we went, how it was going to be like, you could look at the floor plan online and it was literally like four rows total of vendors. Mm-hmm. So I was like, Oh God, this is going to be amazing. So a bunch of, a couple of us went, get there, go right to the con- convention center. Cause we went on Friday, got there at like whatever, 12, 31 o'clock, go into the show. My guys are walking behind me. We kind of make the rounds. We literally do the whole show in 20 minutes and then left. Oh, no. <laughs> Realistically, the only people we stopped and talked to were Printavo, so Matt and Bruce, and then went to see Alex the Easy Way, hung out with uh, Frank Two from GSF. Okay. And then uh, Anatol. And then we bounce out of there hmm. and then uh yeah so anyway i walk up to fucking printavo's booth and bruce i've, I've fucking met him before like i've seen him in real life don't and even he, tell me he didn't recognize you no he recognized me but he was like wow you're way taller than i thought you were and then two other people said that at the show they're like wow you're way taller than i thought you were you know what it is like you said it's I the think high like, back chair right they think like you're really <laughs> short like you're like that's the nor- like a normal chair. I'm like six two, six three. Like yeah, you're you're a big boy. Like you. <laughs> well, the funny thing um, is too is like we went to uh, we went to Chicago and uh, Justin from Barrel Maker too. He was like, "Wow, I thought you were like five five mm-hmm. foot tall." I was like, Mm-mm. "Everybody anyway, knows I'm the tall one. I'm a they giant know. ogre of a man." Well, so anyway, we. Did that thing. Uh, Alex Easyway took us out to dinner. We went to Gordon Ramsay's. That was awesome. Good mm-hmm. good night of talks and hangs. Alex What'd busted my chops. Uh, the funny thing is, is I usually get the pot pie and they took it off the menu. And uh, so I was like, oh, you know, tell I kind of. Tell me you got the chicken fingers. <laughs> I did not get chicken fingers. Uh, I, should, I should have. That would have been a good move. I don't even think they have chicken fingers. So anyway, like. Chris gets like beef Wellington. Sarah gets like Wagyu steak. Brian gets beef Wellington. Alex gets beef Wellington. And the other dude gets like salmon. I got a burger. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we do that. It's awesome. And then we decide let's keep it going. And we went to hard rock, met up with Matt and Matt was at the roulette tables. So I get there and Alex and Matt are going hard on roulette. And then I'm like, I don't know shit about roulette. I know like from movies of like black or red and that's like it. And Matt shows me how to play roulette. I'm like, all right, here's like, you know, some money, Matt, like here's some chips, like show me how, to, how it's done. So Matt starts winning stuff for me. Like I end up with like a fat stack of chips. I'm like, all right, hell yeah. Like here's another 150 bucks. Like let's keep going and pretty much lost it all. Oh, yeah. See, once you win, you leave. Like you walk out. We tanked it. Mm. We blew that. And then we went to, uh, saw some bands play at hard rock. Did you see the video I posted on my stories of that lady and the guy dancing? I did. And I was like, and I think I said, I hope you danced with her. No. So anyway, mm-hmm. that lady, uh, we, me and Matt watched her smoke crack like two minutes after that video. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I thought that she would have smoked crack before. It, it looked she was like probably it. all night long cracking it up. Probably all, probably. So all she night. was sitting in like a chair next to us, and Matt's like, "I think that lady just smoked crack." 
And then we watched her uh, continue. So she was, she was partying. Um, It sounds like you had a great time and you learned a lot about screen printing. (laughs) Yeah. I went back the second day by myself to the show. I ended up hanging out for like three hours the second day. Yeah. So like I saw all the same people, but like had long conversations. So you had a long weekend and you saw a comic afterwards, like during Mm -hmm. on Saturday, and then you finally made it home. Mm -hmm. And then what happened, Dylan? What happened when you got home? Because we had a we had a podcast scheduled, Mm -hmm. a recording scheduled, Mm -hmm. but we weren't able to. I don't get it. Like what happened? I know you ran into some issues. What what were they? Mm -hmm. Uh, I was gone for the weekend and I didn't know if I was going to make it back a for the recording, but I did make it back early. You did make it back. I yeah. did make it back. Yes. You did. But I did not want to immediately turn around and go back to the shop and be gone the rest of the night so that my family wouldn't see me. So right. I did. So the, I pulled the family card. What you're saying is that you're a really good husband and a really good father. Right. That's, and I told you to fuck off. <laughs> yeah i now i know who's more important mm-hmm. I, I we we established it yesterday mm-hmm. didn't we okay yes. well i wouldn't i wouldn't have done that to you so but. i also heard that you had an exciting uh saturday evening oh yeah so i had a barbecue mm-hmm. and i had so there was a couple of uh screen printing nerds in town your screen printing nerds were texting me throughout the evening (laughs) hopefully they were texting you like video Mm -hmm. live streaming all the shit talk that was going on yes yes Mm -hmm. very much so so you heard it all Mm -hmm. yeah so tc from tc screen printing was in town and then our buddy ryan Mm -hmm. from covered in ink Ryan told me that he was talking to you guys about aliens and conspiracy theories and everything. And he was weirding everybody out. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when you get a bunch of screen printers around, it seems like screen printing is what's talked about, but then, you know, but then try bringing up aliens, you know, and dark stuff like web that. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Feelings. Mm-hmm. We started talking feelings. Mm-hmm. So it was nice. Yeah. Tyler was texting me, wish he said he wished I was there. You know, yeah, I'm so, I should have texted you too that I wished you were there. Well, you didn't, so <laughs> sorry, yeah. So, so I called you this morning, and you seem to be having a bit of the Monday. So, is that over now, or you feel better? It's still Monday. Well, yeah, it's still Monday. But... it was more just me still mad at you. I was a little, you know, acting like a little bitch, I think, because right. you didn't, yeah. you know, really apologize yet, still haven't for what. See, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So we, we shouldn't get into this. Not right now. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, what do you call a shoe made out of a banana? Uh, oh, a shoe banana? Banana yep. shoe? A slipper. <laughs> that's, that's silly. Yeah. Well, I got a few from listeners. We can oh, do it really? now if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do one. Okay, yeah, so I'll yeah, do yeah. one from Lister. Marv Blast asks, what happens when a frog's car dies? I don't know. It gets towed. So did frogs, you... Frogs and toads are different. Yeah, well, that's better than my slipper banana thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I started telling people about the benefits of dried grapes. It's all about raising awareness. Come on, raisins. Fine. Yeah, I don't like the ones where you just state facts. I want to be asked the question. Okay. Which one of King Arthur's knights built the round table? Sir Lancelot. Circumference. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's a good one. All right. Good one. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. But you should should like walk away. That's it. All right. I need to end You're done. I need to end on a high note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that. Okay. 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 Yeah. Um, Let's talk about our sponsors so we can be on time. Yeah. No? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. (laughs) Easy way. That was stupid. I don't have to say easy way because I'm getting ready to to tell. I'm getting ready to say the sentence. And so Mm -hmm. I need to get better at this. 
That's okay. Easy we're Way's only, line of, uh, huh? huh? I was going to say we're only like 60 something episodes in. I mean, we'll get it down. We'll get it eventually. Easy Way's line of eco friendly chemicals will get the job done faster, more efficiently, and will cost you a fraction of the cost per screen. Easy Way. It's the easiest way. We did. That was pretty good. It was so that was fluid. pretty good. That was, right. It was. Mm-hmm. Got that button. Oh, yeah. Listen to that. Unscrew. Mm. Okay. Ready? Ooh. Yeah. Frank. Frankie. Frank has a place. It's a special place. Narnia. It's in Narnia, Illinois. And you know what they do there? Make screens. The That's best right. screens. Right. Graphic screen. Dot com. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, next we have Monarch. And Monarch makes a super high opacity mixing system. Mm-hmm. It's one of the things. That's my favorite thing. The Vivid system is the one I use. Mm-hmm. One I use too. Mm-hmm. And you're using uh, Yeti, right? For your white? Oh, well, both mm-hmm. Stark and Yeti. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's good stuff. It is. And uh, we have a Stark. I said that with my K. My K was like Stark. <laughs> um, we have a Stark. That's a better K. Mm-hmm. Uh, black. Did you know that? I saw Stark too. Black. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yep. It's matte oh. though. Ours is matte. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the matte's the matte's way nicer. I like it. We've been using a ton of it. I mean, we. I just placed another order for more mixing colors. So, just trying to stay up on it. It's great. Smart. Great. Great stuff. It is. So, Monarch ink better, print better, be better. Live Moss. Monarch. Monarch. (laughs) (laughs) Action engineering. I'm supposed to sound like an engineer when I say that. Right. Um, But action engineering, what Dylan, what do they do? They make tons of screen printer accessories like Mm -hmm. pallets, squeegees, flood bars, uh, racking systems, pallet, rubber, pallet, rubber, uh, Anything you need for any kind of brand of press, for the most part, they have it. And they're constantly innovating, making new things. They make a ton of mm-hmm. stuff for like DTGs and stuff too, as far as their palettes. And, really? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah. They make a ton of stuff. Yeah. Didn't your dad invent DTG or something like that? Yep. That's DTF. That's, you... That's something different. <laughs> we cannot put this in there. That's no good. It's <laughs> <laughs> no good. <laughs> Um, um, you're getting confused. Mm. Uh, yeah, but, uh, you should go check their stuff out for sure at, uh, actionengineering.com. Correct. And they get a discount if they put in shirt show, get 15% off. They do. So we have a few more minutes and you have a special thing. I have special, uh, yeah. Ready? Is it your booty cheeks? Oh, it is. It's the front side. Yes. Wheat bread? Oh, hell yeah. It's wheat bread. Ugh. Is it a hot dog? Are you eating a hot dog? A toaster? <laughs> Why are you making toast right now? Well, because, motherfucker, it's dinner time. Okay. And if it's your fault, then I'm here. Okay. Dude, fuck that. No, no, shh. No. <laughs> Be, this is Dude, that shit is fucking gross. Yeah, Did well, you try it before? I have not, but oh I smelled my God. it, and it smells absolutely delicious. It smells like death. It smells like if you found an animal that's been sitting in the wet sun for a fucking week on the road, and then you smeared it on toast. Well, our buddies from aisle six sent it to us. And I had a bunch of my employees try it and I did not try it because I know better. No, hell no. That's a dick move. You should have absolutely tried it. It I didn't make them try it. I asked them to try it. So you're going to do a full on spread on that toast, right? 
You know it. God, I'm so excited for this. I haven't eaten dinner yet either, by the way. I had a Rice Krispie treat before we started. Go grab, go grab your Vegemite. Come on, man. I really don't want to even try it. Let's see it go on. I want to see it go on. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Squirt that. Oh, it's so much. It looks like chocolate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shannon. Also, also looks like fucking old blood. Shannon, if this is bad, you promised me this was going to be good. He, he um, broke that hard. Our buddies at, at aisle six in Australia. I feel like <sighs> down, down under things taste differently. Oh, God. Hmm. Dude, you have to eat that whole piece. <laughs> Hold on. It looks like this, it looks like tar. Yeah, that's <laughs> pretty much what it is. Okay, you ready? Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's so <Go> funny? <laughs> like, I know it's gonna be awful. I already know. Big bite, big bite, bud. Oh yeah. Mm. You're hating life right now. Got a little, got a little on my mic. Mm, keep eating. <laughs> the fuck is in here? I fucking told you, dead creatures. <laughs> it's gross. It's like Hold yeast on. extra. It's like the. It's like brewer's yeast. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. So you want to finish your dinner? <clears throat> hey, we're both smart now. Yeah, so it's got yeast extract. Yeah, like from salt. Yeast, from yeast grown on barley and wheat, then salt, mineral salt. It's so small, I can hardly read this. Malt extract, and then some flavors. <laughs> some flavors. Nothing in there sounds good. <laughs> well, I'm hungry, man. It's dinner hey, time. All our Australian friends, I love you. And, uh, I'm sorry you have to eat this. Should brought some PB, some PB and J. Mm. Well, we can send him some PB and J. Maybe they should try that because I don't know, man. <laughs> I did the I did that. Is that good? Yeah, enough? that's fucking brave what you did that's already. A clean I'm bite proud right of you. There, yeah, that's right? a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Solid. Now go outside and burn it. Not going to lie, I just burped up a little bit. Burped up a little Vegemite. Nice. Okay. So. You want to talk about feelings? Not really. Okay. Well, our guest is here. And this week, we have Allison Collins. And she is from Parkway Print Shop. And do you know where that is? I really don't. Take I know yes. she's on the East Coast. Let's just make something. Did you say up. North North Carolina? It's close. It's really close. Really, really, really close. South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good next guess. Yes. <laughs> but no, the other direction. Virginia. More north. It's right. Virginia. That's what it is. Okay. That's where she's from. You ready? Oxygenate that brain. Take a deep, deep breath. Let all that out. Hey there. I like your Hawaiian shirt. Hey, I like you. Hey, Allison. We're going to do the whole episode like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Hey there. Oh, gosh. Is this what we're doing? Yeah, we're whispering. That's she good. signs off immediately. <laughs> She's like, oh, hey, I got to go. See ya. <laughs> you know, I knew what to expect going in, so. Oh, yeah. A couple of jackasses, really. For sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what's going on? I like your choice of uh, camera angle so you could get people fighting. Yeah, I, um, you know, I have the natural light right now, so I figured that I needed to do press in the background. I thought it was true. I see it. It's been weird. Like I'm in the shop alone by myself and like 
with our old shop, there was not a lot of like foot traffic, you know? And now there's like a lot of people kind of walking by and I like, I've been here by myself and like random people have come in. Like, um, I have these, these two young kids that came in that I were homeless and I was here by myself and I like didn't have any money. And like, I, it was just, it was weird, you know, like being in this big giant building. So now I, uh, lock the doors. Are so. you up front where all the windows are? <sighs> no. So that's that way. I'm the, the building is, is, um, it's, it's wiener dog shaped. So it's, oh, it's okay. only like 40 feet wide and then like over 200 feet long. So, um, that's the front of the building. And then I'm in the middle ish of the building. I think I'm so, going to steal it. And I'm going to start saying that my building is wiener dog shaped. It is really, that's what I've been trying to explain to people when like, cause we're trying to get a, a second auto in here. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's awkward cause we need something big. Like, I mean, at, at least 12 colors, you know, mm -hmm. um, of course the sun's like directly in my eyes now. <laughs> um, it's good. It's great. But, so when you get into that many stations, it gets really w wide. Um, well, so you could get a, you could get an oval. That's right? what we want. That's what it, we want to do. <laughs> it would fit in your wiener dog shape. Exactly. I think that's why more. actually they developed ovals was for narrow, like long, narrow shops. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the Asian market, their buildings, I guess, mm -hmm. are like really long. Right. Yeah. So we're, we're probably going to go look at one. Um, I know machine gun graphics has one down in North Carolina. So hopefully like we might be able to go see theirs. But um, when we got, when we started talking to rock about it, we talked about um, it, the smallest size it comes in is a 16 station. And they said that they've actually never sold one of those before. So um, I guess normally it's like 20 and up. So. Well, why not go big or go home? Right. Um, Maybe, I guess we'll just need to see. I, I'm not used to like our, our current press. It's um, an eight ten, but it, we don't have any of the heads that are empty, you know? So I guess it's kind of, logistically like trying to figure out where I should have empty heads for the flashes and whatnot. Um, cause like now we actually only had one flash for three, oh, two, I guess two, almost three years. Cause our, um, our old building didn't have three phase and, mm -hmm. um, we didn't just have, we didn't have the flashes take the most electricity. You know, so we didn't have enough electricity for that second flash. So now that, um, we have three phase and, uh, we got a second flash and, um, I find myself moving it kind of a lot. Like I, every single day I'm kind of moving them around, which is a little bit of a pain because you have to adjust the off contact kind of all the way up. Um, so that that head doesn't come down on top of the flash since it's, it's in a print head, you know? Yeah. Um, so I guess I would like to minimize that on the new press. Um, having yeah, we only, we only have one flash on our eight ten. Yeah. I mean, the second flash is really nice though. Like, I mean, yeah, it's nice if you can use it, but I feel like on that press, most of the time I'm only putting like one to four color prints anyway. Right. So I don't I have, to I don't, I don't have an option. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we're having three on the gauntlet. So how many stations nice. is that? 14. Or, yeah. Well, yeah. So 14, I, 16, 14, right? 16. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think I would want, three on a, on a bigger one probably at least two definitely yeah. but um it just seems like lately i mean we had not done a ton of like uh, we we do a lot of multicolors you know but like lately it's just been kind of relentless with um so i was on vacation last week but the week before last we had done i don't know like two seven colors and three six colors which seven colors on this press this this shirt that we printed on saturday for our beer release is seven colors yeah, and but we it's, were nice, able to, it's nice to do seven colors on a white tee. Right. Yeah. So we were able to do yeah. that in one rotation. We did three colors flash and then four colors. But um right. and I can get a lot of stuff done in one rotation with only the one flash, but it's definitely like I mean, some of these jobs that we're doing seven colors, it needs that second flash. So right. that adds a rotation, I'm with you. which I'm with you. Our eight color has two flashes because you can do you can go white, flash, color, flash, highlight white. You know, and that's off. what we we did that like all day mm. today. Mm. So yeah. and I I what I guess I don't love is that um so now since it's that flash is occupying a head and then so we have two flashes and then we have the roller um in the head print or in the, on the press pretty much all the time and um so I'm finding that I have to take a lot of screens out to put more screens in which is like a time suck for me versus like being able to pop something in right next to something if that makes sense. Right. Um, so it, it's a flow. 
Um, but the second flash honestly has saved us a bunch of time. I wasn't sure if it would, because I'd gotten pretty good at dialing in, you know, what on what, when I could, but, um, it really is just like, it's almost a band aid, you know, like I don't even have to dial it in because I have that flash now, which is super helpful. So tell us a little bit about Parkway and how that kind of happened. And then what made you guys want to get a, the new shop? Um, well, do you want to start at the way back? Yes. I started screen printing. Go way, way back. It all? Okay. All right. Yeah. So um, I kind of have the, I like a generic um, screen printing story is that I got the speedball kit. And I was like pretty heavily into the music scene. And um, my boyfriend at the time had like a little independent record label. So I was doing a lot of like um, canvas patches and like record covers. Um, so not, nothing really that I would need to super cure because I did not really know how to do that. And um, emulsion, the speedball emulsion was like an actual nightmare that I really could not figure out. So um, I dabbled with that a little bit and I was like 17 at the time, probably. And then, um, I kind of put it away. And then, um, so I was working at a grocery store for a few years during high school and then after high school. And, um, what I didn't really, store? it was well, called food lion. You probably don't have them in New York. Mm -hmm. I've heard yeah, of food it's, lion though. It's a strange name and the logo is really weird. Um, <laughs> But yes, yeah, so I worked at Food Line. I liked it. Okay. It was fine. I had a really bad manager, just like toxic. I'm like the type of person that like, if you needed a day off, like she was going to cut your hours like 50% the next week. Um, and so I had that'll, gone, that'll teach you. Yeah. Oh my God. She was bad. And then, so she wasn't my direct manager for a while. And then she was going to be my direct manager. And I was like, I got to get out of here. Um, so I had gone to I did like two semesters of college. Um, I wanted to study graphic design, but my parents told me that was not a career. Uh, so <laughs> I did I the exact same thing. I only did two semesters and I was like, fuck this shit. Yeah. Right. So I, I was studying marketing, but like at two semesters, you weren't really doing any actual, like kind of, you were just doing core classes, you know? Yeah. And I got, I was bored. And so I just didn't go back there pretty much. And, um, so anyways, I found a job on Craigslist for a screen printing job. And I was like, okay, um, I know how to screen print. Um, right. <laughs> so, and it said no experience required. So I was like, okay, sick. And, um, I get to the interview and it said it was a group interview. And when I read group interview, I interpret it as multiple interviewers, um, not multiple interviewees. But um, so I show up to this interview and there's like uh, eight of us pretty much around a table. And you guys had to fight like fight to the death and you won, obviously. Uh, I honestly don't. It was a train wreck, um, honestly. So the first question was, you know, we're all answering the questions, right? First question was a icebreaker and it was, who's your favorite athlete and why? And I do not like sports, really. I'm just not a sports person. So I said Tony Hawk, but then I had to like come up with kind of like a fluff answer as to why I thought Tony Hawk was the coolest athlete. And apparently I did a good enough job on that one. Um, but my favorite part actually was uh, one of the questions was like, why do you want this job? You know, and I think almost everyone at the table said money, which <laughs> really clutch answer. Um, but so that was the first half of the interview. It was like, um, a sit down, you know, and then the second half. And they was did actually, this with eight people. Yeah, just wait till it gets worse. Um, oh God! All right. The, the second part of the interview was so they had two manuals at the time, so they let us loose upon the print shop, and we um, everyone set up a job, just a single color, like straight on the palette. Um, they didn't have pre reg, so that was. Uh, or actually, I don't even know if they were using registration marks. They were not using registration marks at the time. So you were kind of eyeballing what looked like the middle of the design and then like using fingers on either side to see if you think that you were in the center and then a T-square. Um, so then you taped it up and then you got to pick an ink and print a shirt. Um, so I picked a like max opaque lemon yellow that had probably been sitting on the shelf for like two years without a lid. And it was... God, I thought I knew how to screen print, but it was so bad. My shirt turned out so horrible. And um, I had mentioned that I had screen printing experience during the interview. And then like towards the end, he was like, you know, do you guys have any more questions? And um, someone was like, so do you need experience to get this job? And he said, you know, no, actually we prefer that you don't have experience. 
And I'm like, God damn it. Like, you know, I'm the only one in this whole interview who said that they knew how to screen print. Like I'm screwed. And well, your um, t-shirt proved otherwise, but it looked like my, shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess since I did such a bad job on the screen print, got a second interview and I nailed it. I'm, I aced it and <laughs> I got the job. Um, so interestingly enough, uh, the person who was interviewing me at that time was Jared, my current boss here at part of print shop. So, um, it was his dad's shop. So the, his dad, and then his dad had a business partner. Um, and they were, they were pretty successful, you know, um, they had the two manuals and then they had gotten a, a brown electric print while I worked there. And, um, they, they had, you know, maybe six heads of embroidery. So yeah, I, I, Jared was working in the back. He, um, he, Jared was, um, working with Adidas. He was kind of in like, um, upper level management. Um, he's working at Georgetown in DC. And then I guess maybe something with the merger with Reebok, um, his position was eliminated and he applied for a higher up position and didn't get it. So he had worked in the screen printing shop with his dad, you know, for like all growing up because his dad probably started screen printing in the eighties. Um, and the idea was that his dad was getting older and that he was going to move home and kind of take over the print take shop, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause his dad, his dad's like so ready to retire. Um, so Jared was working in the back when I first started. And then I kind of took over managing the print shop. Um, and he moved into sales. So, um, uh, I liked working there, um, to an extent I had another really ted manager. His dad has a 50% business partner who was just chaotic, I guess. Like if she would have bad days and good days and when she was nice, she was really nice. But when she would be in a bad mood, it was just like, she'd be like, we, we would have the door open, you know, to like let a breeze in and it would be like letting a glare into her office. And she'd be like stomping back there and like slamming the door. No music is allowed type of, and, um, Oh, there was this one time where I like, there's two, there's two really good ones. One is there, she was trying to tell me that there was, the screen was burned incorrectly. And I knew that the screen was good, you know, and that wasn't the problem. And she got so mad. Like, uh, she, the screen, the screen was like resting on the pallet, you know, and she like threw it up and then the like squeegee went flying and then ink went everywhere. And I just started laughing because she is like a 60 year old woman and, um, she's acting like a child. <laughs> And I'm surprised, I guess I didn't get fired then, but I was like, I couldn't handle it anymore. She was being outrageous. And um, then the other one was, uh, I was always the first person at the shop and then almost always the last person to leave. And one time we were really busy. And uh, I remember she did the little, the little finger wag, you know, and she said, she said, that always me. makes me just go like this. <laughs> she said, somebody she said, does hey. this to me or this. Yeah, just right to the yeah. middle finger. Well, right, exactly. She said, "Hey, we're working till six o'clock this week." I said, "Oh, okay. What does that have to do with me?" And she said, "Oh, no. Everyone's working till six o'clock this week. Um, we're busy." And like that just made me so mad because that's like not how you approach that situation at all. Like I can't even imagine. Like I mean, that's crazy. Like literally, I would be so happy. I'm always I'm already there till six o'clock every day, anyways. Right, like, you would have been there. Right. Absolutely. If you had not been a dick about it, but, but I digress. Um, so anyways, um, I worked there for about three years and, um, Dave is Jared's dad who owned the print shop. Dave is like a ray of sunshine. Like he is my favorite person. He's like my own dad. He actually texted me this morning. He said, print them baby. Um, <laughs> so he was, he was good cop in the situation. Exactly. Like he, like, I only saw him mad one time. And I like, will not forget it. You know what I mean? Like he right. is always just chipper and like, it, he really like kind of would soften situations, you know, um, where I was just like frustrated with her and, and he would just be like, mm -hmm, which was <laughs> cute, you know? Um, yeah. so anyways, uh, Dave's business partner was just not being very transparent with Jared about the business. And I, Jared kind of gave him an ultimatum, like, I'm going to leave and do something else. If you guys don't get it together, like you, you, they wouldn't tell him anything. It, 
they wouldn't share anything. And they were really bad about communicating with each other even. Um, so that was like a problem. I think Jared like took a week off and was like, you guys figure this out. And they didn't talk one time. So Jared was like, all right, well, I'm going to quit. Right. And, um, so he decided to start another print shop, um, because it was what he knew and, um, in a different town. So like 30 minutes North and I had gotten Jared and I get along really well. And, um, I was, I wanted to get out of there. Like I had been looking for other jobs because I was so tired of just the everyday nonsense that was going on. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to go work for Jared because Jared's my pal, you know, and did he, did he kind of offer you something when he was leaving? (sighs) Yeah. I mean, basically, yes. Like whenever Parkway needed an employee that, um, I could come on board, you know? So I moved to that town, uh, like the next month. And cause my lease was up and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And so then I kept, um, I kept working at the other print shop, um, for a few months and I would come, I would work at the other print shop, seven 30 to four 30. And then I would come work at Parkway, like five to nine a lot. <laughs> and cause he didn't have any, like, it was just him, you know? So did they, but, did they know about it? Did they know that you were going to another print shop afterwards? No, the answer is no. You paused long enough. I know, but they, if they, <laughs> they would. I think that they had to know something was up because I moved to that town that they knew Jared was starting a print shop in. You know right. what I mean? And right. I just came up with some lame excuse like, you know, oh my friend wants to live there or whatever. Um, but it was only thirty minutes away, so it's not like a giant weird commute, I guess. Right. Um, That's not too bad. Yeah, I don't. If they didn't. I, they they had to know something was up, but you know, whatever. They never said anything to me. So finally, um, man, I could not take it anymore. Like I was really liking working at Parkway with Jared and it was just like a totally different environment. You know what I mean? Um, we were kind of doing just things totally different than what they were doing there. Like I didn't really know anything about screen printing when I was working there. And I didn't know that some of the things that they were doing um, were bad. Um, I'm just thinking like, they probably had four two thirties and then all their other screens were one ten. I didn't even know what mesh counts were. I just thought that there so was what like, what were you, what were you doing there then? Well, so I had started screen printing in the beginning and I did screen print all the way throughout um, every now and then, but mostly I was, I would do all the receiving. I would burn all the screens, code all the screens, um, handle the schedule there and then help the boys um, if they needed anything on the press. So that was, what I was doing there. Um, so I gave them like a two month notice that I was like, I can't do this anymore. And Jared was like, ah, I hopefully will be busy enough by then. Right. And, um, so was he, was he printing too? Like during the day, like he was sales and printing. Yeah. No, he really had transitioned into just sales. He, he was not doing a lot of printing at all. I mean, unless like we really needed something. Um, but there were four, there were typically three to four people that were running the manuals. So like they, I would be folding the shirts for them, you know, and they would be running the manuals. Um, so we were pretty like well staffed back there, I guess, as far as it goes. Right. Um, we were never like crazy busy. Um, so I have a question. Yes. How do you guys handle, or what is your policy for if an employee, uh, you know, works at a different shop or, I guess wants to work at a different shop or just work anywhere else for that matter. Like let's say they want to do DoorDash or something like that, or, you know, how, how do you handle it? Have you ever had that uh, situation before? I think you're really overestimating um, the size of our shop, but um, (laughs) yeah, so I actually do. I am, I have a pretty much fully trained press up now and he'll say like he wants to do DoorDash or something, which I guess is fine, but ultimately he never does it because he's, tired from screen printing all day. Um, but right. yeah, I mean, I guess I don't really, ca- you couldn't get another job at a print shop here in our town, really. Um, if you want to have a second job, I, I don't, I guess I would just feel bad because I would feel like we're not paying you enough that you need to have that second job. Like I don't want you to have to do any other side work at all because exactly. I want yeah, to be paying you enough that you can take care of yourself in 40 hours a week because 
I don't remember what it's like to work 40 hours a week because I love work like a crazy person right now. And I know that that sucks. You know what I mean? I don't want that for anyone else. Um, so I, I don't even really like doing overtime with people because I don't want them to have like that, that bad work-life balance, you know what I mean? Or like start Mm -hmm. to resent coming here. So, yeah, for sure. Um, so have you always just been kind of like shop manager basically, or like press operator? Yeah. Well, I mean, so right now I am, I'm production manager, but I'm also running the press full time because we're just having like really bad growing pains. Like we got into kind of a sticky situation and, um, it's been rough out here. Um, well, well, it's funny because like when I, when I first met you, I think we talked online, but like when I first met you, met you like in, I think it was Long Beach, right? Like when I first met you was in the Long Beach situation. Yes. That was, uh, one Cause of the- you stayed at the, the frat house, right? Yeah. But also like I went and I didn't know anyone at all. And then he was like, one of my friends was like, Oh, they can <laughs> pick right. you up. Yeah. That's I right. We were, we were, we picked you up at the airport. Yeah. Well, you picked me up at the airport. I'm with like eight strange dudes. We like walk a mile in the rain, <laughs> in the rain to, to uh, in and out, in and out. Right. But then we met Andrew <laughs> in our that. city. Right. Yep. And then he, he had a minivan. He had a minivan and he drew, he drove us all to the house. Right. But the important part is that the minivan did not have enough seats. And I was like an unwanted guest. So I sat on the floor <laughs> of this minivan from LA to Long Beach. And my, I just was sitting there like kind of contemplating my life decisions up until now, because I did not know any of you. Yeah. But, but it worked out. Yes. It all worked out. You guys were great. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the reason why I bring that up is the fact of like, it's rare to see somebody at the show that's, they're on their own terms that's not like an owner you know what i mean usually it's owners and then they bring some employees or their buddies or whatever you are like one of the rare few that i know that are just like i'm really into this industry i don't own a shop but i run a shop and i just want to like be with people learn things do that kind of stuff so that's why i was bringing it up is just kind of like you're that rare human that just wants to be there I like to just say that I'm a psychopath, I guess. Well, um, I mean, yeah, there's that, but, but, um, yeah, no, definitely. So that first year at ISS, it was kind of like a, on the whim. Like I booked the tickets like two weeks in advance. I only went because, um, I found round trip plane tickets for like $200. That Airbnb was super cheap because there were like 40 smelly dudes staying in it. And, yeah. um, yeah. So you were the only girl there, right? I'm actually almost positive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that was, and that was the weird house too, like with the troll rooms and mm-hmm. it was just what a time to be alive. But, um, so I, <laughs> actually, the best way to put it. I think I paid for that trip myself. Um, I, Jared might've helped me, but it was like, so last minute. And I didn't even, re- I was just like, Hey, I'm going to long beach, dude. Um, it's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, is that's super rad for like an owner to have an employee that invested that they're willing to spend their own money to go educate themselves. Absolutely. But I also think it's, it's not, I don't know. It's borderline. I mean, it's, I'm overly invested for sure. Um, There's nothing wrong with that though. It just seems like you're passionate about your career. Oh, definitely. Yes. I mean, I love what I do for sure. Um, Otherwise I would not be here right now. I mean, it's just like my life is, in chaos right now because of screen printing, but yeah. Yeah. So anyways, when I first came on at Parkway, we actually didn't have enough work for me to do. Like Jared was like literally just employing me out of the goodness of his heart. Like I was painting murals on the walls and doing all sorts of wacky things like that just to get hours. Um, And yeah, so we got busy really fast and we got the auto at the end of our first year which was like an absolute lifesaver. Um, so we knew that we wanted to get a bigger space because the space that we were in was only 1200 square feet. So, um, the press was like smashed in there. Um, and you really couldn't walk around at all. It was, it was bad. There was nothing. (laughs) It was hot. There was no AC, you know? Um, so we had actually, when we first saw this building, it was probably, so that, last ISS. What is that? 2020 ISS. We had 
already had an accepted offer on the building. So yeah. um, we were supposed to close in May, I think of the, of, of 2020. And then, or it might've even been, yeah, I think it was May, but so we ended up delaying it because when COVID hit, you know, everything would just went, I mean, like dead everything stop. was up in the air and, eat and right. weird. Right. So yeah, we didn't, it was a huge amount of money that we were going to be investing. And in, so we didn't want to um, just fly into the building when like literally nothing was going on at all. So we pushed right. back the um, closing until August of last of 2020. And, and then the we seller, closed. the seller agreed to that. Like you just re-signed some sort of closing date and they said, okay. Exactly. Yeah. So the building has been, had been unoccupied, I think for at least seven or eight years, like, it has only ever been one thing and that was a um, furniture electronics store. So uh, like super, it was built in 67, um, super retro kind of like, I, I don't know if the guy died or what, but um, so they were just trying to get rid of it and um, they were happy to wait a few more months to finally have, I guess, a buyer on the building. So um, yeah, so we closed in August and then did, 15 years of renovations um to get it to where it is now and we're still not done actually i was listening to them cut concrete all day today it was super pleasant um because the back half of the building is not finished yet um and so they're cutting into the concrete to put some plumbing in there the funny thing is is when you first started posting pictures of what that building looked like there was a building in Binghamton where I'm from that looked just like that from the front. And I always drove by it. Cause it was in kind of like a shit part of town. Like yeah. it was abandoned. There was like weeds growing up. And I was like, that place would be a perfect like place for like a small print shop, like a one, two auto print shop, like storefront out front. It was kind of like in its own lot. And I was like, man, it'd be cool to buy that. And then I remember uh, like a month later I drove through there and it had been completely demolished and they already like redid it over with a parking lot. And I was like, yeah. Oh, cool. So they actually, um, Jared loves the story because that he likes to think that that's how dedicated he is to the print shop. And he really is. But, um, so there's a car dealership, um, right next to our print shop and they offered us a million dollars to bulldoze our shop and turn it into a parking lot while we were mid renovations. Um, so we didn't have anywhere else to go. We were really kind of like strong armed into this because, um, obviously we love the building. The building's awesome, but, uh, and we got super lucky with it, but the land here is crazy expensive. So it would have been a lot more money to buy the land and build something on it. And especially right. it wouldn't have been in like a weird kind of off we're pretty close to downtown um so we're we just kind of got lucky with the location and um, but even for a million like you can earn that back if it's a decent space and with the building being the way it is like right yeah so not, we, i mean it's a good it sounds good at first but realistically if you think about it you're like fuck like this is a good spot i'm good um exactly so probably would have yeah. been too. what's your setup so you have you said you're close to downtown um, so do you have a lot of walk-in customers or are you just, uh, like are you a contract shop? What's your, who's your customer? So we are, do almost all local businesses. Um, so mostly like breweries, restaurants, um, events, things like that. Um, a ton of breweries. I feel like I'm printing for a brewery every single day, but, um, we don't do a ton of online stuff. So like kind of very few random customers that have hit us up more since we started, we hired um, a girl to, to do our social media and we've kind of had an uptick in people noticing us on the internet lately. Um, but it's all almost pickups. So like we're almost doing no shipping at all, really. We have one fulfillment customer that we do some shipping for. And um, then my boyfriend is a, a teacher in a school district, like an hour from here. So we ship a lot of their stuff because no one wants to drive an hour and across a bridge tunnel, which is always a nightmare. Um, <laughs> now, are you trying to get that social media person to get more online sales so that you can kind of diversify a little bit? Um, not, I don't think that that was like our inherent, like that's not necessarily what we, what we wanted. We just kind of wanted, um, an internet presence like we had been doing it ourselves for a long time and i just 
I had done stuff stories for a while, but I just got too busy to handle it. And mm-hmm. um, same with Jared, you know, so Jared is handling all of the sales and like the business side of things. Um, so he's like, we're both doing the work of like four people. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that we just wanted to create um, a presence online. So she handles all of our social media accounts and um, our email newsletter and like um, some blog posts and stuff like that. Um, That's a part-time person or full-time? Yeah, she is part-time right now. I, I think that she she will be full-time in the future, I would guess. Um, but that's really our only, that's our only other front of house employee. So, I mean, it's Jared and then Victoria, our social media, she works um, maybe about 20 hours a week. And then, um, so I manage production, but um, it's just me. And then I have a, a press op that we just finished training. And um, we have a girl that does receiving and catching at the end of the dryer. And that is our entire operation uh, right now. <laughs> nice. That's so how, one. how did you, you said you just finished training a press op. How did you go about that? Where, where were they, had they any experience prior or like, how did that work out? Yeah, no. So he didn't have any experience, but um, we knew that he was a strong candidate just based on like, his employment history and like kind of his tenacity really is we don't. And I still do agree with this is that we don't really prefer to hire people with experience just because they come with bad habits that we don't necessarily want to bring to the shop. Um, I keep a super clean shop and I, uh, I don't want to say I'm bossy, but I do. um, I understand that there are many ways to do things, but be bossy. (laughs) But um, so, and also I've never met anyone I don't know that maybe we've had one person that I know of that applied with experience and we actually didn't need anyone at the time. This was a while ago and we referred him over to, um, Dave. So Jared's dad's shop and he works there now. Um, so when this press op came in for you know, like to apply, I hope your first question was what his favorite athlete was. Oh my God. I actually tell that story to everyone, but, uh, it was not. <laughs> But so I actually, I do the second interview. So Jared, um, Jared, we do two interviews. Jared will do the first interview. It will be like a sit down. Um, and then I just kind of walk people around the shop, explain to them what they're doing, answer any questions that they have. Um, so he, he weeds them out for me, which is nice. Um, I like that. I like that. I, I do the same thing. So, uh, but normally it's the first interview. So the first interview, I do a shop tour, like a long one not just an abbreviated, or I suppose I cut it short if I can tell. Is, already. This, the, is this the two hour tour that you're telling me about? <laughs> right. Like when you Jeez. show up here, yeah, you're here for a while. You're trapped. <laughs> but I mean, I think that it's a good, a really good way to find out if they like about them, you know, cause I'll do a lot of talking initially mm-hmm. about, Oh, here's our shop. And here's kind of, you know, our, where we started and this does that. And then I, I'll ask them. A few and this does that. Know. <laughs> this thing does that. And this thing does, this thing does yeah, the no, thing. No one, no one does what knows what anything does. Yeah. So. I just make it up. I don't either. Yeah. Well, that's what I think is funny is like some people that come in that have no idea about screen printing. You try to show them things. They're just like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> if you're doing that for two hours, they're just like, dear God, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Most, I think that the, the actual shop tour is pretty brief. And then most of the, it's, it's me answering questions probably. If they have questions to ask, which I'm a lot like, of people are shy. So I'm like super shitty at the interview process. I feel like, I feel like if you even get selected to come here, I've already creeped the fuck out of you on the internet. Like, yeah, I've tried to find everything out about you that I can to be like, this person seems not like a serial killer. Right. And then yeah. I'm like, Hey, come in. And then I usually literally I'm like, sit down on the couch. And then if I start talking to them and I get like red flags of like, this isn't going to work out. I'll just be like, all right, cool. I'll let you know. But like, if they, we have a decent conversation, I do the walk around the shop thing. Like, Hey, let me go show you around. And then I'm usually like, what do you think? Do you want to work here? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, okay, start tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever said no. Um, but I, also, I don't know if I've ever done an interview, like in the dead of summer at the old shop. So um, my answer might've been no, if that had been the case. Yeah. I love that informal 
way of hiring, but have you ever sent a job proposal, you know, like with the, with what you've discussed, you know, like I've probably had, I've probably had four or five people that I hired that work here that we never talked about pay until they got their paycheck. (laughs) That's crazy. That is crazy. They're just like, yeah, I want to work here. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then they work like a full, they work like a full two weeks and I give them a paycheck and they're like, oh, this is what I make. (laughs) (laughs) That is like really just not, I don't feel like that's how it is anymore. I mean, just like some people that we had on our last round when we were hiring, like, you know, 18 year old kids, they're making more, they're making like 16 bucks an hour at Best Buy, you know? So that was kind of like a reality check for us, I think, is that like, I don't know, like when I started making $15 an hour, I thought I was the baddest bitch on planet earth. And, you know, like, so it's just kind of everyone needs to make more money, you know, Um, which is, I guess, a tough reality. The hard part is, is it's like, it's definitely been the, out of all the years we've been in business, like the last two years have been like the most ramp up for me that I've seen in like, giving people more money it's like before it was like okay you get a raise a year or whatever right we'll talk about it and then like i'll give you a raise i feel like over the last two years i've been like eight raises yeah no i mean it's it's kind of what you have to do is like that's i mean how we're reevaluating now is like okay well i make this much money but you know we agree that i should make the second the, the second most amount of money in the shop but we're hiring a um an account admin now. And so that, that person needs to make, you know, a certain amount of money, really. I mean, they should make, you know, I don't know, $50,000 a year or or whatever. So it's just kind of like finding that balance between Mm -hmm. all of your employees. So, so how, how do you do it, Andy? Do you, are, are people making money at your shop based on seniority? Like they've been there for a certain amount of time, like their money always is you know, here, because my problem is, is like, I kind of was doing that, but then when you hire somebody new, and they're like, oh, I need to make at least like, you know, $15 an hour. It's like, right. okay, cool. I had two people at 15. Now I don't want to hire someone brand new and give them 15 because then it's unfair to the people that made 15. Definitely. Yeah. I think that's really one of the toughest things right now about, like you said, um, wages have really increased over the past six months because we really need people. And so we're offering more, right? And how is that fair to people who came in and started lower? and over time have received raises and basically are making just a little bit more than some of the people that are coming in. I like, uh, Allison said, I've been reevaluating other people's pay and saying, wait a second. So I think there needs to be some adjustments because it's not, I don't, um, it's not just seniority here though. Like just because you've been here a year or two years or five years doesn't mean you deserve you know, uh, raises. I mean, I think that you have to be contributing more. Sure. It's, 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 it's awesome that you're loyal and you like this place and you want to stay here. And I think that's worth something, but that's not the entire equation. You know, I think a lot goes into a raise more than just, okay, you were here a year, you get some more now. Yeah, I believe so too. I'm just saying that like, the reason why I said like eight raises is because we hired a couple people. Mm-hmm. And like I said, it's just the same thing. It's like, okay, I hired someone out in the shop and then it's unfair to the press operator or whatever that, you know, has been here for five, six years. And then it's like, okay, well, obviously you're worth more than someone I just hired yesterday. hundred percent. Right. And so I, I recognize that and I, and I'll, I'll say, okay, well, look, I, I think I have to give this person more. And I'll bring them in here and say, you know, you're killing it. And I know like they expect the raises to be on an annual, like a performance review. And so all of a sudden you pull them in out of the blue and give them a raise. It's, it's unexpected. And so mm-hmm. I think it's also appreciated too, you know? Oh, so, definitely. I mean, anybody's appreciative of getting more money. I'm just saying it's, sure. it's a weird situation. I feel like these past two years that situation. I haven't experienced in like 12 years. It's like all of a sudden now it's like, Oh shit. Like <laughs> I need to like stagger people all the time. Yeah. It's, right. it's tough because like, I feel like, I don't, I, I don't know if I deserve it. I I'm already making so to me, I'm making so much money, so much more money than I used to make. Um, so it's like, do I really feel like I need more money? But also I don't want someone who was just hired versus like me who literally named Parkway print shop, um, <laughs> to make well, more money your, than me, you know, is your boss going to listen to this? Oh yeah. Uh, yes. But we, then you, yeah, you need a raise. Today. You need a raise. No, I, she's, she's a super dedicated worker. 
the hardest worker you're ever going to get. Buys her own Allison tickets. Allison needs to a raise. The Long Beach. She's I educating actually, herself. I just did it again where I, um, I didn't, I wasn't planning on going to print hustlers because for like a single ticket, it was like four seventy five, And then the hotels was crazy expensive in the flight. And so I was like, ah, this isn't even a thing. And then I had been talking to Matt Richard, uh, Richardson, obviously. <laughs> and then Matt um, got the Airbnb that he tried he to get got, me into. Like, he got, I, you know, I literally sent him a, a message on Facebook that said, hey, there's a 5% off discount code. And he like, <laughs> he went for he it. Messaged he, me, went, he messaged me. I don't remember what it was. It was like 11 at night or something. He was like, hey, I got an Airbnb. Uh, do you want to go in on it? Cause he says, he keeps saying he owes me because last time we went to long beach, like I got a house and like, we shared it with Relentless. Right. Uh-huh. and I told yeah, him, I, I was like, like, I just, I was just like, dude, like, don't worry. Like, don't worry about it. Like I got it. It's covered. The house is covered. Just come hang out, whatever. And he was like, really? And I was like, no, it's fine. Like it's covered. So now every time we go anywhere together, he's like, oh, let me get your house. And I'm like, no, dude, it's fine. It's fine. Well, so the thing is, it's like I already had Ace already done. Like I already right. have the hotel. It's already fine. And he's like, oh, just refund it and then stay at our house. And I'm just like, yeah, like I don't want to be I, like, yeah, but part of me kind of I just want to like not have to worry about it. Yeah. So it was so funny because we had been talking about it like a few days prior. Uh, he was driving to Texas to get that uh, yeah. directed garment that he doesn't want to talk to anyone about. Mm -hmm. And um, he was like, yeah, he's like, I, I'm on the fence. Cause you know, I don't know what COVID's going to be like around then. And then like literally two days later, it was like, he was like, oh, I'm going to buy these tickets right now. And I was like, I haven't even talked to my boss about this yet, but um, I all right, let's do it. And um, then he like, literally, so I'm at work, you know, and I'm not messaging him back. And like 10 minutes later, he's like, um, where, where should we stay? And then like five minutes later, he was like, I booked this Airbnb. And I was like, <laughs> all right, here we go. I hope you can find some other people to stay with us because it's like, I think it sleeps nine. And yeah, I'm pretty it looks sure super nice. Two things. One, I think Print Hustlers is sold out now. So yeah, right. congrats, Bruce and the gang up there. Cool. And two, yeah, we should get an Airbnb. Let's not stay at the Ace. Um, you want to well, refund our $1,200? I'm telling you right tickets? now, there are... are a bunch of beds at the real, at the relentless um airbnb right now that are available so you know just contact matt at relentless I'm just making a com. relentless party yeah well mm -hmm. he's only bringing um i think he's bringing one of his sales guys and then it's because he bought he got the three ticket pack you know mm -hmm. and then he was given like he's not giving me but he was like you can save some money i'll get the third ticket you know so um, well, i just assumed that like i would be getting you know shit face drunk on screwdrivers <laughs> And then I would just want to mosey upstairs into the ACE. That's yeah. That's where I was at too, because so I had looked at getting an Airbnb for myself, like just, but I was like, man, I'm not going to want to be hanging out with my friends and then have to navigate Chicago by myself at like midnight. Like yeah. it's not, that's a no for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll help you again. You know, I'll, I'll help drag you around town. I'm, I'm telling you, you guys are the best. I don't know. I don't know where I would be <laughs> without you guys. Right. When are you going? Are you going Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Are you staying Friday, Saturday, and then getting out of there? I I think I'll I'll fly home on Sunday probably, but I don't know when I'm going yet because Matt is. I haven't like I didn't fact check this in my brain um, when he was talking about it, but um, he was saying that he wanted to drive, so like I could fly to Nebraska and then ride with them. But he was mm -hmm. saying that the reason he wanted to drive is because he wanted to go to some shops. And then the shops that he named were, um, I'm pretty sure he, he mentioned Rockford Art Deli and then um, Nar City. And then yeah, I was thinking about it. I was like, yeah, but no, the, Nebraska's nine hours away. So like nothing, all of those things are like close to Chicago. So I don't really know why. Mm -hmm. um, there's like nothing really point to point in between. So I, I don't know. I, we haven't really talked about it yet, but I yeah. wanted to wait on, I think, booking the flights. So. I haven't talked to you about this yet, Andy, but I was... Uh... I talked to Bruce and I talked to Alex about it. And Alex at dinner was like talking about Thursday because he's going to print hustlers because easy way is a sponsor. He's like, dude, we should totally have like a, like an, like a six or an eight man, like hang out where we do like a podcast together. And he's like, and I was like, yeah, we could like sit around a fire and smoke cigars. And he's like, yeah, we could like have whiskey and cigars and like sit around a fire. I was like, yeah, I was like, he's like, we should just record the whole thing. I was like, dude, there'll be 10 minutes of usable audio on that whole thing. <laughs> Uh, so he kind of wants to do it. And I said something to Bruce and I was like, I was like, yeah. And then Matt was like, hell yeah, let's do it. And so I don't know what's going on Thursday right now. I know that Bruce wanted to get together and do some kind of like thing. 
Um, but I also was thinking about, I don't know, I'm down for anything for those three days. Uh, hope I'm hoping everything goes fine and nothing gets canceled. Right. Um, but we'll see how it goes, I guess. Well, Chicago moved to um, indoor. Too. If that's probably what it's called. <laughs> indoor masks yeah. today. Yeah. Starting today. Yeah. Well, it was like even um, even Atlantic City was all masks as far as like the show. Oh, really? Not in the casinos. It was like chaos. Million people. <laughs> That's weird right, that so, they they had it at the convention center, but not at the casinos. Well, totally separate thing. But the convention center was like ISS and screen printing people being like, oh, mask mandate, you know, let's be, you know, whatever. Right. And then as soon as you leave and you go to the casino, it's just like thousands of drunk people <laughs> crawling on each other welcome to so, atlantic city welcome to atlantic city exactly so i don't know whatever um so pretty much you've been with parkway since the very beginning then and what uh one of my questions was kind of when you moved into that new space i know you did a ton of planning of like where should this go where should this go can you walk us through that how did that work out for you Oh God. Um, like everything in my screen printing life ever is a uh, guesstimating and trial and error, I guess. So I think we did a pretty good job. So, and we, we did a lot of this at the old shop. I mean, our old shop was really calculated, um, to like maximize on that space for sure. So we had done before we got the automatic in the first shop, you know, cause so we went from the cruiser and a, um, we had a fusion dryer an eight foot fusion dryer and, um, we, we ended up getting the rock tunnel because, um, the electrical capacity of the building, it was going to cost, we were leasing, you know, and it was going to cost so much to, um, upgrade to three phase. So we, um, ended up getting the rock tunnel with, with the, the rock when we got it. And, um, that was a, that's a 20 foot dryer and in 1200 square feet plus this 810. So, um, we did a lot of planning, like just uh, with the M and R online tool, which was super helpful, even though we had, we, we, you know, we had looked at getting an M and R and, um, ultimately it kind of boiled down to a two, a few things. But one of the things is that the M and R rep that we had would basically wouldn't give us the time of day. Um, <laughs> so, but then, then the other option was MHM at the time and only SPS or not SPSI, uh, Hirsch was selling them and Hirsch was terrible. Um, so, and then we, we went to go visit another shop um, about an hour north of us and they had gotten rid of their M&Rs and got the rock. So we were like, all right, we'll, we'll get the rock. Um, and side, side note on that real quick though, is it's sure. funny, like <clears throat> I had this conversation in Atlantic City with a couple printers and we were talking about, you know, he was saying that he had a saber and then the other guy was like, oh, I have an M&R. And then we were talking about rock and all this other stuff. And it was like, realistically, it's like Ford versus Chevy like yeah no Toyota. We it's like they're all fucking good presses they all do right. what they're supposed to do but the main thing you should think about is a like you said like if the mnr rep didn't give you time a day like why would you want to go with them if they're not going to be a good back and forth source for like any issues or getting something new or helping you figure out the press so it's like whatever machine you get it should be because you have great service like, right. Yeah. So I, I know we would have been happy with any of those machines. Right. Um, and we love our rock for sure. And we've had a great experience really with, especially with um, if, when we've had technical problems, which is almost never, I don't want to jinx it. I don't have anything to knock, knock on, on but um, yeah. So gotcha. uh, like I said, we had done like a lot of floor planning at the old shop and then we did a lot of floor planning, planning here too. We would just come over and um, try to just, kind of tape things out on the floor and, and, um, figure the out the flow of the space. Yeah. So we ended up choosing a very bad flow on purpose. Um, and that is that the press is at the front of the shop and the dryer is at the back of the shop when all of our customers are pickup. So, um, we did this for aesthetic reasons. We wanted the press in the front of the shop. So we do cart all of the boxes really from the end of the dryer through kind of the, the, to the front of, of the shop. Um, which has not proved to be a big issue thus far. Um, but do you yeah. have like a bay door in the back? 
Yeah, so I'm sitting in front of the bay door right now. Um, but the this is the number one problem with the the shop that we did not think about and is a huge pain in my ass presently is that the alleyway on the side of the shop um, is a, at least a foot lower than all of the doors. So um, <laughs> we did not think about this at all. And even with just regular receiving, um, it's it's a big step. Like I got little legs and everyone actually that works in the print shop, I think is under five, five. Oh, you so, have to step down into that. Yeah, exactly. So, oh. um, right. So it's, it's tricky. So what we do now is, um, we just get UPS to throw the boxes in. We open the door like halfway and they just kind of throw them in. Yes. Um, and our UPS driver is awesome. And all of our UPS drivers have been absolute angels. Um, but the problem is when, so we got five pallets the other week and what we have to do now is there's no way we got a pallet jack, but, um, there's no way to get the pallet into the shop. So we have to break them all down. And, um, the other problem is that, so we, um, we had initially planned on having receiving in this space that we have here. And so the total, um, square footage of the shop is, is just short of 10,000, but, um, so there's, there's a few that I think we, we have 3000 in the front and 3000 in production. And then, um, the back 4,000 is not finished right now. Um, so we thought that we would have space for receiving in here, but we realized actually before we moved in that we didn't want to do that. So that's, we're having the back finished right now and we're going to take 1500 more square feet for, um, receiving back there. But <laughs> the problem is, is that, um, there's only a single door to that space presently. So like, even if I was able to just kind of, we have other pallets in the back of the shop, like just, you know, kind of throw them onto another pallet, but then I can't take that pallet anywhere because I can't fit it through that back door. So, so can that you, was- <clears throat> Can you open that up? But is there a way to put like a loading dock in the back? So yes and no. So we're not going to occupy the entire 10,000 square feet initially. So we're going to rent out the back 20, it's somewhere between two and 2,500 square feet to a um we're leasing it out to a car wrap shop so we're having it finished for them so there will be bay doors back there so in the future when we when we do occupy the entire space that we'll have that there um but really the only other option i think is um raising the alleyway which is going to cost a ton of money um, so i just looked up a couple things for you really quickly on you all right Yep. And you have, a, and maybe you've already done this and explored this. I'm not sure, but you can get a walk ramp and you can dolly them up or you can get a dock. We have, so we receive um, things two way, one on pallets and one UPS, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have two dock doors and UPS pulls up to one of them and they're always lower and they just throw the boxes up onto our dock. And he, he loves it actually. But when we receive um, like a box truck or a regular um, 50 two footer or 53 footer, we have a dock board. And because whenever they pull up, it's not the exact height and you can buy different risers and you can buy a seven inch riser or, um, or even larger. And so you could just buy, and you think you said it was almost a foot, right? You can mm -hmm. buy a dock board with a riser and you can just pallet jack right up or yeah, build something just, out of wood, I suppose. Definitely. No. So I think that that would be a good option, but for right now, the problem is, is that the alleyway is super narrow. So, um, like we, there is a, at the very, there's a second do bay door at the very back and it has a little ramp, um, mm -hmm. that's made out of wood and you can move. Um, so right now the alleyway has just enough space for a car. Um, so if we have that dock, then it kind of has to stay inside somewhere. Um, and then the, the better news is that the, the other, um, door in the receiving area is a lot lower. It's like a six inch step. Um, so that's a lot better too. Um, and we hate having to open the bay door really because of all of this luxurious air conditioning, um, <laughs> that we, we don't want to let out. So well, we, we, I mean, we do the same. So we don't have the, we don't let the dock board or plate, um, stay outside. So it's on, mm -hmm. it generally it's on the pallet jack and we just roll up to our dock and then pull it off and set it on to the, we just did it today. Like we got a pallet. We just did it today. And so you could have it. All right. Yeah. I'll get video coming. And it's the, we kind of, ours is overkill because our dock board is 
Um, I think it's for like 10,000 pounds. Like you could drive a forklift over it. I wanted it to be, I wanted to be able to drive a forklift in, onto a truck and then pick up a piece of equipment and then drive it off. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And so it's heavy duty. Like you don't need that sort of a, a dock board. And that's why we have to use a pallet jack because it's heavy as shit. You can carry it, but it's just too heavy to carry it far. But that's an option, right. you know, to get a, to get a board and keep it inside and then just wheel it over, pallet jack it over, you know, yep. just a thought. Yeah, no, definitely. There's a lot more space in, in that back receiving area. Really. The only thing that will be back there is receiving for now. So, so um, what else, what else have you guys found that you didn't quite plan for that you're finding now is like an, Oh shit. That has got to be the biggest one. It is bad. But, um, I, I guess for me, one of the things that's awkward is the way that, um, so we, there was a pre-existing wall in the middle of the shop that's um, cinder block, like the outside. And so we kept that pre-existing wall and um, we put our reclaim rooms there. So I think we did a pretty good job setting up the reclaim rooms, or I guess they're just screen rooms. Not There's like, it's kind of in a U shape. So, um, you know, you, you walk in and you go, there's just reclaim. So no imaging happens there. So just the dirty screens are in there. They're getting reclaimed. And then they, you can wheel them into the dark room. Um, and then you come out of the dark room and there's just a clean booth for imaging, which has like really helped our workflow. Like, I mean, the water tank and then having an actual dark room has like made a, oh, this is, we had a bathtub that we did all of our screens in um, at the old shop, which I thought was fine. Like I, I never had any problems with it, but um we got a backlit washout booth for the first time when we moved here. And oh my God, I cannot believe we waited so long to buy one. It was like a thousand dollars and it is awesome. I mean, I, it's, it's stupid not to have one. It's funny. Cause like, it's funny you say that because I, I see on like Facebook and all this shit all the time, like all these printers, like they're like, Oh, I DIY this booth or I DIY this exposure unit or whatever. And I'm like, I yeah. get it. Like I get that you're trying to like save some money or whatever, but it's really not that much money and it actually does what you need it to. And it's way less headaches. It's like even buying like a poly washout booth to start and then getting like a stainless one later, that's like backlit and it's meant for screens and it has a screen holder. Right. <clears throat> it has a place for like your, uh, pressure washer and all that stuff. It's like, dude, just fucking buy it. It's like, yeah. I think that we, we, we had used the same bathtub situation at the other shop and I thought it was fine. So I never like recommended that we get anything different because I didn't know any different, you know? Right. But then and, you get it. You're like, Oh my God, like, why didn't I do that? Right. I mean, <laughs> and what's so ironic is that we've always had like a thousand dollar commercial grade pressure washer sitting underneath our shitty bathtub on cinder blocks. Right. So it's not like we didn't want to spend the money. We just didn't know that we needed to, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's been, a freaking game changer. But so anyways, the, um, r the rooms are kind of in the middle of the shop. So it's, it's front space and then production and then reclaim. And then, um, basically receiving will be behind that. And then behind that further is where the, um, car wrap business will, will reside for now. Um, but so in the future, you know, we can definitely get a second automatic up here in production. Um, but when we go to add a third, um, you can tell them to get the hell out. Yeah, exactly. So, but it will be weird cause we will probably have two production spaces almost. Um, but you know, cause I think that if we ever did add embroidery, um, it could probably hang out in the receiving room or it just is going to need to go in a different building. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That 3000 or whatever you said you had up front, what is mm -hmm. in there? So um, we're going to dabble in some retail. So we're going to try to do like the cool gift shop type vibes. Um, think like um, uh, nothing too fancy or jupe mode or um, Rockford art deli, obviously. Um, we don't really have any of that here and we're in a super touristy town. Like uh, I can't go anywhere because these damn tourists are driving 25 mile an hour town. Um, right. cause we're in colonial Williamsburg. So like Jamestown, the Ninian Pinto, Pinto, the Santa Maria type situation. Right. Um, so people do travel here and, um, 
there are a lot of gift shops and um, we do a lot of contract printing for the gift shops and it is so whack. I mean, I literally am printing these things and I'm thinking, who is buying this? It's so bad. Right. Like I can make a way cooler shirt than this kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So we're going to do, we're going to try a little bit of retail up front, but then we also have um, some co working space um, for our current and future employees. And then Jared has an office up front. Um, there's a conference room and then there is a, a kind of open concept kitchen. Um, that's about almost nothing's done right now. We, we just had some, um, uh, custom welded retail fixtures installed on the wall. And, um, we're going to build kind of a divider in between the kitchen and the, um, retail space. Um, there's a couch, like kind of a lounge area. So it's a lot of like a future break room. Exactly. Yeah. So that was one thing that we didn't have at the other shop and it would drive me crazy is because if Jared was meeting with a customer in the front space of our old shop and I wanted to eat lunch, I was like eating on the pallet or like on the one table we had in the back of the shop. And it was like the one time a day that I got to escape the million degree heat. So it was really shitty if I had to be in the back. Um, so it, we're really excited to have somewhere. Yeah, our to eat. first it's break room <laughs> here was at a shelf at the end of our dryer and the end of the dryer, there's a folding table and that was the lunch table at the end of the dryer. Right. And so if you ate and you were sloppy and you got shit on the folding table and didn't <laughs> clean it up and then we're putting shirts right on top of it, it was a disaster. Right. No, exactly. Yeah, definitely not. My favorite is when customers show up around like lunchtime and one of the employees decided to heat up like <laughs> old Indian Shrimp. food or like something, <laughs> like some kind of soup. Mm-hmm. And like the whole shop, just like the whole office just reeks like gross <laughs> ass food you brought from home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That always sucked before. Now it's like separated enough where it's not so bad. But right. yeah, our break, our break room used to be a mini fridge, a toaster oven and a microwave like right next to each other. And you were, you had to find your own space to eat lunch, basically. Like you could heat right. up your food and keep your food there. But when you want to eat, you like just went like most of us had a desk, but like, if you were one of the guys in the shop, like you just kind of like grabbed a chair somewhere and just kind of right. sat down and ate lunch. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I mean, getting, getting a new shop, you definitely did good by planning that out. Yeah. So it is a lot of space in the front. Um, and it's, it's empty and awkward right now, but I'm sure it will be um, rad when it's, yeah, when it's done. So, yeah. and then the back, um, I have a small office and then that's the only other office in the shop. Um, I, I, we, I think, uh, Andy, you guys do this. You have kind of like an open co-working space for your guys. And uh, even more open. So, uh, we just knocked yeah. down some walls. Did you knock down the, the walls for the room that the designers were in? No, they still have that room. There's no doors to that room. So it's just an open room, but and right. it's mostly you considered glass. a bead curtain. Did you just uh, <laughs> extend like the front counter then? Is that what that was? We knocked out um, both counters that we had and there was like this dividing wall and that all came down and we built out this new counter and I, they're coming on Thursday to measure for quartz that's going to go on top Ooh. of it and down it. Yeah. So I'm really stoked. It'll look way, way better. And it's going to be way more functional for the team because we've never had four people at the front before. And so we've always functioned with three, um, well, two and then three, and now we have four. So right, you um, need just trying to create more space. Yeah. Like desk space and workspace. And right. you know, when somebody comes in and you're going through shirts and you're trying to decide which shirt you're going to get or which color and you lay a bunch on a counter, it's, you know, you can never have too much space. Yeah. Um, I have a question about SOPs before, before we go to the SOP question, which is different than SOB. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to say that my very first washout booth I got and I installed in my garage and I didn't have a drain for it. It just drained into a bucket, like a five gallon bucket, but I was still so happy to have a real washout, like a backlit booth. And so if you're in a garage shop and you're considering it, you know, and you're trying to DIY your own or whatever, and you think, oh, I'm going to pass over because I I can't drain it. Just drain it into a five gallon bucket and then dump the bucket. It's a hassle, but you know, it changed. It's like a, it's a game changer having a backlit booth, a really good one. It's awesome. uh, Well, there's a lot of benefits. I mean, you can make a, 
like a lot of people make their own booth or whatever. And that it's fine. If you do that, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying it's nicer to have an actual booth, but like having it backlit is huge because when you're blowing a screen out after exposing, you need to make sure you're getting everything out of it. You know what I mean? You need to make sure you're getting all the detail. And if you're cleaning screens, you need to be able to see if there's anything still in the mesh to clean. Right, out. Yeah. So like so backlit should be priority. We didn't get the backlight on our reclaim booth and uh, it's, it's big regret for me. <laughs> on the new one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We got a reclaim table, the like Saudi system. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really expensive and I think the backlight was an extra thousand dollars. And so we, you know, us coming from that other reclaim booth, we're like, ah, oh, we don't need a backlight, you know, it'll be fine. Um, and then, I mean, right after we got it and we got the other one with the backlight, I was like, this would have been really nice with a backlight, but. Just go get some LED <laughs> picture things off of Amazon and put them behind it. Well, it's solid stainless steel. So how were they going to backlight it? They, I guess that they, it's not solid stainless steel there and they would put yeah, they, a panel. Like a plexi. Yeah, there's a plexi behind it and then there's lights, like usually like fluorescence behind it or something. Yeah. yeah. That's how my first one was. Mm. All right. Well, SOP. Standard operating procedures for people yes. who don't want to say SOP. Okay. So I have been we have been in desperate need of this for so long. And then I heard Steven uh, talking about it on Printavo and it's got me, <laughs> I tried again anyway to, to, to get it going, you know, because I can't do this myself. I need to, I need to go to each department and ask each department to help out. Like, Hey, can you help me make this? Yeah. And they so should I started because they're the ones doing it. They're the ones doing it and they know what they're doing every day. Plus it's just, it's a huge task. Do it all to, for me to do it all. And right. so, um, you know, I had a barbecue this weekend and Ryan was there and I, and I told him that, and he's like, make a video. So just literally, you know, take your iPhone and hit record and then stand at whatever station you're at and say, here's what I do. Like, here's how I run this wax machine. For example, like here's how we run this CTS this is I, this is the first thing I do this is the second thing I do, third thing I do, fourth thing I do, whatever, however many th steps it takes and then record yourself doing that. And you could either make a PDF and, you know, type that out, type everything out too. And you can have those in like a word doc, which would be awesome too. But you could also just save that video file. And he said that, the, that he was at a, a shop where he installed iPads at each station and the video was ready and you just hit play. You know, if you ever were wondering what to do at that station, hit play and you have somebody that just talks it out. So now I did you ask Tyler the same question? Because I'd like to hear what his <laughs> answer was. Um, was Ty I don't know if Tyler was there when we were talking about that. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Why, you're going to say he needs, he would absolutely have. Oh, and he would definitely have fucking SOPs out the ass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just how Tyler is. He's smart and he's all about the data. He is smart. He is all about the data. I told him that data joke again, by the way. <laughs> data. Um, data. <laughs> so terrible. <laughs> Um, didn't but, land. <laughs> what do you guys think? Record like video recording of yourself or whoever it is at each workstation on how we you know, like what they do. So if they're gone, you have it. I think it's good. I think it's good to either have a video or just have them have a sheet like a, you know, like a bullet point sheet and be like, oh, I do this and then I do this and I do this and maybe give it, let them have it for like a week. So that they can be like, oh shit, I forgot about this or whatever. Yeah. Um, I kind of like that, but I also want to do the same kind of thing, but have like laminated cards or sheets at each station that say like this, like basically the same thing of like, oh, dryer temps for this, 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 and this. And then, you know, at the heat press, it's like, if you're doing patches, it's this settings, these settings, these settings, not necessarily like the operating procedure, but just kind of like quick notes. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, like you said, it'd be nice to have some kind of like bullet point thing of like visual. This really is like what is request required at this area. Right. I really like visuals and also like the idea of video because some things are complicated and some people when they read directions or they don't even really want to read directions and they just do. Whereas a video, if you, if you watch it, 
I don't know, maybe it will. Well, it's good for training purposes too. If you get somebody new, it's like, Hey, go watch this video of me doing this. Hey, this is me. This is how you run this. And then you're pushing buttons. And I really like the pictures, uh, like the visual pictures that you just talked about too, because I want to, so something that um, I like to do, and this maybe makes me a little psychotic is that when we turn our dryers off at the end of the day, um, in the winter, I open up the door, you know, our, you know, the door, the hood door, I open that up because I want the heat to come in here and heat up our space. Right. Well, in the summer, I don't want anybody to open up the door. I want it to exhaust out because we have AC on and why are we going to open up the door to the dryer? Right. Let all that heat out as it cools down. But, and so I've said that before and I've said it to everybody here, but I don't think, I think they forget like, which way am I supposed to do this? I don't really know. And so they also, it be don't, cool? they also don't give a fuck. <laughs> right, but like let's be honest like your employees like i don't fucking i don't pay for this I, building i don't give a fuck about this i think they would if they just knew the right way so what, couldn't i have a picture right there on the dryer and it says summer don't open the hood when you turn this off winter open the hood there you go well, what about spring and fall what where are the temperature guidelines on this it's either hot as fuck or cold as shit like <laughs> that's all we get here I would love to share my screen with you because I've been working on one of these, but Ooh. I don't know if that translates well with your audio. Well, fuck, watch YouTube, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Here, I can do it. You do that uh, real quick. Oh, I got to grab I, something. I, like, it pertains to this. Okay. I can't do it until I quit, so I'm, I might not be able to do it. Um, can you Can you walk us through it? Uh, well, Roughly. the first page is really good because it has a picture of the rock doing this and then it just has the rock in the background. <laughs> um, so that's all I got on the first page so far. No words. But um, basically, it's just pictures of all of the controls on the machine and kind of the standards of where they should be set. Kind of standards that will work on almost any job um, because I this is one of the questions I had for you guys is I'm having like a really standards. Yeah, right. Like pressure, angle, speed, kind of, that right. will at least get you through any job and it will be okay. Um, mm. Because, uh, like I said, this was one of the questions I had for you guys. I'm having a hard time teaching, I guess, the I, the how is easy, but the why is hard, you know? So it's easy to teach someone how to change the angle of the squeegee but the why you should and why you shouldn't in certain situations is what's tricky you know what i mean because i run my squeegees pretty much straight up and down all the time um and i really am only changing the angle if i need to like lay more ink down you know or like kind of smear it to an extent um which i don't i don't know it's it's hard i don't want people to smear things you know what i mean i want my i don't want my prints to be smeary um but you know like if i have a, a solid white under base, you know, and then just a solid top color on top of it. Like I might run my squeegee angle lower, you know, because I'm just trying to cover that under base and I'm not worried about, you know, kind of smearing into other colors or doing any wet on wet printing or anything like that. Right. Um, so yeah, the, the guide is pretty good. I think, um, it's not done yet, but it's just pictures of everything on the machine and little arrows circles kind of, um, explaining what all of the buttons do and like going through the menus, um, on the touch screen and stuff like that. So I think it's, it's, I didn't even spend that long on it and it looks pretty professional. I will just say. That's so. awesome. So but that's yeah, for that, press operator. So you're making an SOP for a press operator basically. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would love to do it for everyone for sure. Like, I mean, because we've just been in this bad situation where like, just for instance, like my, um, catcher was having a hard time the other day keeping up with the dryer and like I couldn't figure out why you know what I mean because I think catching shirts is a walk in the park you know what I mean I could do it with my eyes closed I'm like waiting on them to come out of the dryer you know but at the same time is like I haven't had time or I can't be back there with her to find out why she's struggling you know so I'm just trying to have to guess with me running the press, you know, like, you know, what was going wrong and the, the, what was going wrong in that, in that situation is she was just being a little too perfect with the way that she was stacking them. Like she was really obsessing over, you know, making sure all the bottoms were straight and was totally flat. And this was like a contract client that they go and they, um, 
it's for the gift shop. So they go, they, they hang and they tag everything there. So they're not keeping them in the boxes and presentation is important, but it's not like, it doesn't have to be perfect, you know? And, and I think that she should spending, is no good in that situation. R- exactly. Right. And I, I understand cause I'm the exact same way. Um, but at the same time, I understand that there's kind of like a threshold of, you know, she was stressing herself out because she wasn't able to keep up and, you know, the shirts just kept piling up and I don't want her to be stressed, you know, um, unnecessarily when it, it really just was not a big deal. Um, so that's just kind of where we've been at is that I've just kind of had to throw people into things um, that I think are easy, but are maybe not as easy as I think they are. You know what I mean? Even yeah. as far as like loading a shirt, like I almost have a hard time describing how I do it because it's like autonomous to my body now, you know? Well, the thing is too, is that you need to think about it a little bit and like, this is how I do it. But right. also maybe show like these are the other options. Like there's I, stuff oh, you always. can find because yeah. people are there's there's like there's like ten different ways that people like to load shirts, and some right. people are totally different. Like the carts backwards, or people who are printing the front print like to have the shirts flipped over so that when I grab them, they're loading them a different way. Yeah. Or if the no. carts on your right or carts on your left, like so many people are have like different preferences with that. And it's like I the other thing too is like that, yeah. when I was with M&R and we went to Second City Prints, there was something that stuck with me that was like real little, like the production manager was walking me around and he was talking about how, you know, his job is to, you know, go around and facilitate things and make sure things are getting done the way they need to get done and whatever. And then one of the things that stood out to me was he was like, yeah, you know, like, uh, I like to make sure that everybody here kind of cross trains on every spot so that they know, you know, if you do this, you're going to fuck this person over. Right. If you don't do this a certain way. And one of the things he said was that he's like, yeah, I like to have the guys on press grab shirts at the end of the dryer and stack them at the end of the dryer so that they know how it feels like to do that job. You know what I mean? So that you have some, some thing to say with them. And he's like, you know what, you know, what's funny is like, the guys on press used to just like take shirts off the press and like flip them on the dryer or like, you know, just randomly they're thrown on the dryer as long as like print side is up and it's good to go. He's like, once they're at the end of the dryer and they have to catch shirts, they realize that like there's a right way and a wrong way to load stuff on the dryer. So that way when the person at the end can like easily grab them and stack them nice and neatly. So like if you're taking every print and you're flipping the shirt in half or you're, you know, you're going one way, but at the end of the dryer, they're laying them out another way. They have to spin every shirt or they have to do it a certain way. And it's like, that right. shit matters. You know what I mean? Right. So no, definitely. it's like, you kind of need to find out the, like the SOP for that position, because if you want both operators to load the shirts on the dryer the same way, so that the person at the end of the dryer can do their job efficiently. And it makes it more efficient for the press operator. Again, if he gets shirts that he has to print the back on that, the shirts are loaded nicely on the cart. So they're not all just like thrown randomly on top of each other. Right. Um, no, definitely. It, that kind of just stuck with me. I was like, Oh shit. I never really, like I knew there was a right way and a wrong way, but it's like, it never really thought, I never thought about it too much. Cause it was never like a huge bottleneck of like, how do we actually lay these shirts on the dryer? So that the person at the end is not like, Holy shit. Like you're really fucking me over by putting them a certain way. Well, Ryan, thanks for the great idea. Video SOPs. He <laughs> said that um, if you want to contact him, it's Ryan Kasperian at Covered in Ink, and he'll drive out to your shop and make you videos for free. I think it is. Is that how it works, Dylan? For free, yes. Free. He yeah. will he'll, fly out, stay at a hotel, show yes. you how to do everything for free. As long I'm, as kind of over for bar- as long as you have him over for a barbecue and right. you may talk about aliens. Right, right, right. <laughs> So I wanted to, I wanted to bring this up and see what you guys thought kind of going into the training thing or whatever. But uh, my good friend, Christina at varsity uh, was showing me a TikTok video of this lady that basically in her house, she bought these things to where like when her husband left like plates out or garbage out or didn't do this thing, she bought these middle fingers on Amazon. (laughs) So when she finds a plate on a table that's not put away, she just doesn't tell anybody. She just puts the middle finger down on the plate. So that way, when he comes back around, he's like, oh, I fucked up and then puts it Dylan, away. Dylan, no, this is not a good idea. So, your shop. Dylan, it's not. 
I think it's a good idea for Dylan's shop. I'm going to go around (laughs) the shop and be like, oh, this isn't where this needs to be. And I'm going to put this little middle finger down and be like, hey. Passive aggressive. Passive aggressiveness. (laughs) Well, okay. (laughs) Didn't you you call me last week with issues about that sort of thing? I'm pretty sure we talked last week. I know I called you. With your issues. I didn't have any. <laughs> it was okay. Okay. All right. Well, hey, it's time for some listener questions because I have a lot of them. Yeah, I got to check mine because I had a bunch come in too. And the funny thing is, is I probably have six from Matt. Yeah, Matt. Matt is my number one supporter. He really yeah. he's he's who, supporting I, me on my my Matt journey so to screen printing. Matt, Matt? Matt. Matt. Oh, okay. We just had Matt on. All right. I thought you were talking about some other person. I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> hold on um uh, go ahead right, with so yours and as you're talking i'll see if I i've got a couple my, yeah um so poor morgan the first question he has two the first question is yes you can be an investor in my tiny home massive yard community that i'm building it's a gated community with tiny homes but enormous um pieces of property uh and so yes but his second question is dylan where exactly is the box of Star Wars shirts located in your shop? Uh, up your ass, you'd know. <laughs> next question. Um, next question. <laughs> Gren Croy asks, what is our most listened to episode? And the answer, I looked it up because I thought I was sure, but I wasn't sure. And it is the very first one because everybody listens to the first count. one. And then they stop listening to them. <laughs> They're like, oh, okay, okay. They do get better. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. They get way um, better. Side question. What is your favorite episode we've done? <laughs> I don't mind saying it. So I'm asking you. You're talking, you're asking me? I'm Step asking you, toes. yeah. Oh, I don't know. Um, they're all my favorites, Dylan. I mean, there's definitely <laughs> ones for me that were like really good. But what one right now in your mind was like, Right now, this one really My good favorite. inspiration. The one we're the one we're recording. You right now. Pussy. <laughs> I knew you were going to give some bullshit answer. Um, the next question is. You're not even gonna let me say <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Dancing around it. Okay. okay next what's question. your? Say it. Say it. What's your favorite episode? Let's hear it. Well, they're all my favorites. Someone's gonna cry, <laughs> and it's gonna be me. It's like Dylan. Which is your favorite kid? Uh, I definitely tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, bad dad you know what though right? like there are some really fun episodes like definitely good ones but the ones that stick out in my head the most are justin lawrence because basically we got naked at the end and wild boys but alan from proper print shop was probably my that one right now is like fresh in my mind of just like his story and like how everything worked out like that one i love alan to me was is in my brain right now yeah that was a good one Okay, next question is from, oh man, I'm going to butcher this, Subcula. That's S-U-B-U-C-O-O-L-A. Great print shop. Great print shop in Europe. And mm-hmm. he asks, how many washing, how many washings should a plastisol print last until it cracks? Forever. Good answer. It, it depends on how you do your laundry. And that's like how I mm-hmm. say with everybody, like we get customers that come in, they're like, they're like, how you know, do these shirts shrink? And I'm like, how the fuck do you do your laundry? Like, or you just cram a bunch of shit in the washing machine and the dryer, or do you actually do what it says on the care instructions on the tag? Like me personally, I'm a big dude and I hate like drying my clothes. Cause then they never fucking fit me ever again. I hang dry all my clothes. Mm-hmm. Well, so the I answer wash to my that shit question, on cold and I hang dry it. The answer to that question when a customer asks is maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Infin- just say infinity <laughs> um, um, um i think that's no i have i have one more varsity agnes that's, that's christina the middle finger <laughs> okay well cool she has a question here and she asks what does chad look like because based on his editing he might be the funniest he is <laughs> truly <laughs> yep so he says he's gonna send a pic <laughs> okay cool <laughs> Um, all right. So what do you got? Uh, 
What do you find most difficult to manage as far as customer expectations? Ooh. Allison. Yeah, you go first. <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't, I uh, don't really handle the customers very frequently. Like, Which that's is the best fucking department. part of a screen yeah. printer. If they, ha they have no, they don't ever have to hear the complaints from the customer. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. I am. Um, I'm, I'm more managing uh, Jared's expectations um, on like what is feasible and what's not feasible. Like he'll sell something that we've never done before or something like that. And then I'm just like up the Creek because I don't, right. you know, like just th this morning today, I hate printing clear discharge because if something's going wrong with the print, you can't, you don't know it. until it's out of the dryer. And yeah, we ate $300 worth of garments first thing this morning, because I mean, we had printed like, a ton of, sh I mean, cause the dryers, you know, it's two minutes in the tunnel. So we had printed a ton of shirts before we knew that, you know, there it, it kind of eaten through the emulsion. So, um, I just, I hate doing it. <laughs> well, it, it, it kind of brings up a good point is like, I feel like printers definitely like take pride in their work, but I feel like there's times where they're just busy trying to get through the day that they're just printing or whatever. Like, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that the printer would probably take extra time or go the extra mile on certain jobs if they're the ones that had to hand the box to the customer. Because a lot of times, like the person in the office that sells the job is the one that ends up having to talk to the customer. And if something's like slightly weird with the job or you're not 100% on the print and you're trying to give it to the customer, like it's on them to be like taking the shit if like the color isn't right or I mean, we can all say like all of our prints are perfect and then nothing bad ever happens, but that's horseshit. And we all know it. Like yeah, there's no. certain jobs where you're just like, they gave you some kind of artwork or something that when it actually got printed, you're like, we did our job. We did it. What was supposed to happen, but we're not like fucking super stoked on this print. You know what I mean? Right. And then yeah. you have to give it to the customer. And then the, like literally the person in the office is like opening the box and the customer's like, can I check these out? And you're just like fucking fingers crossed. Like, please love these. You know what I mean? No, yeah, it's like definitely. The printers in the back, like I did my job, wash my hands of it. And then like, they don't know. There's, they don't have to ever deal with it. I mean, the story of the order is means so much, you know, I'm, I'm remembering one right now where somebody came in and ordered some shirts and it was a complicated print on not very many shirts. And, um, you know, um, I think it was the production manager. I don't remember who it was, but somebody was like, Oh my gosh, you know, I can't believe I have to do this. But yet at the front counter, it was a story, like the story was, it was her, her son died, you know, and she was making these shirts because it was this, like, it meant so like much to her. On it. <laughs> it didn't have his face, but you know what I mean? Like there was, yeah. it, it was, it, it was very meaningful, this design, but I knew that, but, and so did um, a customer service rep, but, but the, nobody else does, you know? And so sometimes I think that, uh, and because of that, that scenario that happened, I remember when there is something like that to, to bring it up in production meeting, like, Hey, this one, we'll talk about it sometimes. Hey, on this order, by the way, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and so, I'm definitely guilty of that. Like just not wanting to do something because it's such a time suck, you know, and I know that I could be getting so much more done, you know? Um, so I definitely, I, I get it. So, but at the same time, you know, like Jared's not back here anymore. So he doesn't always know, you know, how long, things take like we have this one contract client that they'll drop off I, it, they're a good client um but they have it's like it'll be like six different designs they're all big multicolor backs full full backs um the fronts are similar but not the exact same um where you're having to burn like nine screens for a three color because you're mixing and matching um so like it, it might be a thousand total prints but it's going to take me a day and a half because of the nature of how many teardowns and, and screen setups and stuff like that. So um, sometimes you, you just kind of have to give him a, a reality check on how long things are taking me just because I think he should know, you know, like maybe he's not charging enough or like for a color change or something like that. Like I, I hate doing color changes. I, typically I just burn another screen now. We, we, um, we burn another screen. We never clean yeah. it. Keep going. Right. Yeah, it, it has to be a weird, a really specific situation for me to clean it. Um, but yeah, like our PRU, which is the rock version of the pre-reg is not super dialed. Um, so if it has, 
another color involved. A lot of times I'll just clean it because I'm not going to be able to just pop that screen and it's going to be perfect. Like I'm going to have to make some minor adjustments to it. So, um, that's definitely a time that I would clean it, but, um, yeah, it's just, I mean, do you give a, a customer a price break for a color change? Like if you're charging them screen fees for your contract clients or like, I think that it's a new, a whole new design basically to me because I'm, I'm burning it again or I'm cleaning it, which I'm cleaning it. It's taking the same amount of time as me setting it up again. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. It's just kind of one of those things that I don't know. The customer doesn't care. They just want it done. So right. you kind of, I just charge them for everything, but right. Um, all right. Next question. I'm going to run through the mat ones real quick. Cause I'm just going to rapid fire these. They're mostly not questions. Um, that, that tell tracks. Allison no print hustlers ticket if she doesn't give us that gallon of sunshine yellow. <laughs> he also uh, told me that if I don't pay him for the ticket that I have to work for a week at Relentless and during busy season. Yeah, you'll improve that shop for sure. <laughs> uh, what's Allison's darkest secret? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Well, we'll we'll talk about that at the end when this is over. Okay. All right. Uh, What's Allison's worst enemy? My worst enemy? Yeah. Um, oh gosh, I can think of a bunch of them, but probably <laughs> probably Matt himself. Right. It, I agree is, with that. It's gonna be my yeah. my number one answer. What's Allison's least favorite band? Um, uh, my least favorite band. Oh gosh, I really don't um hmm. Justin Bieber. Oh, actually, you know, we, there are two songs that I've had to officially block off of our Spotify playlists because they come on, like, it doesn't matter what the playlist is. And, uh, the one of them is home by, uh, Edward Sharp and the magnetic zeros, um, really annoying song now. And then also the other one is watermelon sugar by Harry Styles. You may be familiar. With. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can't do Those it anymore. Good. Those are good choices. Um, Let's see. Life of a female screen printer asks, uh, well, it's not even a question. It says she has a squeegee tattoo. That's commitment. That Yeah. I, this is my resume. Mm-hmm. I always say, I, actually we had a beer release this weekend and um, someone was like pointing at my shirt and they were like, is that the thing that you do to use the screen printing? And I was like, yeah, I have the level one right How here. How do you so. do the screen printing? Exactly. Uh, last question from Scott at King screen. And it's very fitting that he asked this question. What lean improvements have you made since moving into your new shop? I actually have a really good answer for this one because, um, I really don't, I, I am interested in reading about lean. I don't really know a whole lot about it. I know that Corey Beal at floodway is super into it. And, um, we actually always used to make this joke at our old shop is that, um, we only had one single pair of scissors at the old shop. And it was always a game. Where are the scissors? It's like a whole scavenger hunt. Um, so we did buy a multi-pack of scissors when we moved here and we do have scissors all over the place now. So that is your answer. Okay. <laughs> do you have it cut out of foam and it's stuck in foam all over on your shop? I wish I had that much time on my hands, but the answer is no. Um, okay. I don't, but maybe in the future one day. Okay. Andy, do you have any more questions? Nope, that's all I have. So, Allison, do you have any questions for us? Um, I did have a few. The first one was uh, about training. And, like, so do you guys have, like, a standardized way that you train your press operators? Or do you just kind of, like, throw them out there and and get your other press op to train them? Or Andy, do you want to go first? Mm, no. I knew you were going to fucking say that. Do you guys have a checklist? Uh. <laughs> I'm probably not doing it the best way. And that's why I agree with Andy that having the, the standard operating procedures is a really good thing to give them, uh, especially even if it's just like a packet to take home. Um, but all we've ever done is basically we have like a lead press operator and we just stick them with that person for like a couple weeks. Yeah. We're like, okay, you're pulling shirts for Randy right now. And then, he's just going to shadow Randy for, you know, a week. And then in the second week, it's going to be like, all right, you start loading shirts or you take all the ink out of the screens and get the new ink or whatever. And then eventually like, we'll put them on another press and be like, okay, you're printing nothing but like one to two color prints from here on out. Mm -hmm. 
And then eventually they're like, all right, we're going to let you do sleeves and left chests and, you know, whatever. Oh, the, every so often they'll graduate to like a more color print or a different location they're not used to. And then eventually, you know, after months, they're kind of on their own, but they're still doing, you know, the four color or less prints. And that's why I always say in like the podcast is like, realistically, I don't have full faith in a printer who was green from the start, not somebody who had an experience is to print anything and to run the press and me not to have to have any concerns for like a year, year and a half before yeah. I'm like, okay, here's like a six color front, six color back oversized with tags and sleeves and everything else. It's like, I'm not going to give that person that job until they're like <clears throat> ingrained in them how to do everything else. Yeah. Because like Allison said earlier, um, it's a lot of times more about the why, not just the how you do this. And right. you don't like really... I want them to know for sure how to do the other things but and you don't... why you do those things. You don't figure out the why part until um, a lot of times, actually, you've made a mistake. You're like, oh, crap, you know, right. this didn't work out. Why didn't this work out? You know, and so you can make that's another thing about SOPs is you can make an SOP, but there's no way you're going to cover every single scenario that that could happen. You know, there's just so many things with screen printing. There's so many variables. And so like our our method is that we generally don't hire um, a press op. Like that's not the position that you apply for. You apply for a press assistant. Right. And you, you don't know your, you know, anything about screen printing and you come in here and it's basically an appre apprenticeship and you learn, you start not knowing anything and you just figure out first how to get here, you know, and where a break room is and where the bathrooms are and all that kind of stuff, you know, like that's hard stuff. And you have to figure out that as you go. And then you learn how to, offload shirts and put squeegees and flood bars in and where the inks are and everything, you know? And so like Dylan said, after you've been a press operator here for let's call it six months, then, then maybe it's time to break out and, you know, set up a one color, lock it in, load a shirt, see what happens. And so and it just goes from there. That, that is if they want to, you know, like not all press assistants want to become press ops. Sometimes Definitely. they're like, you know what? It's too much stress. I'm just going to chill right here and I'll, yep. you know, and be a press assistant. And so it, it just depends. Like, it was like with Zach, like he's like one of the best people we have now and he's on press and he, he started as a reclaim guy. Like he was doing screens and then I was trying to hire another press guy and he was like, I kind of want to do it. And I was <laughs> like, all right. And then he hopped out there and he's amazing. Like he's all about the education now. Like he's always coming in and being like, I tried this. Is this a better way to do this? And then I, I talked to him a couple of weeks ago about like, how to get a better white and to like have lower pressure and make sure you're clearing the screen and you're not like doing too much pressure, like all these things. And he was like, Oh, he was like super interested. And it wasn't just like, okay. And then he goes out and just like, does it. And then like forgets about the why, you know what I mean? The why is important to him because he wants to make a cool print. He's not just doing it because he's got, that's his job. And at the end of the day, he's like, fuck this place and leaves. He's and trying then, to do a better job. And then he, two weeks later, he got his paycheck and it was for less. Right. And he was like, well, that sucks. And you're like, well, we don't talk, you know, we don't talk about this. We kind don't of talk stuff. about this. We don't talk money. Like, but I thought problem. it was, thought it was a promotion. I was you like, know? get the fuck out of my office. Not my fucking problem. <laughs> um, right. So yeah, that's kind of how we go about it. Yeah. Any yeah. We questions? definitely, um, I, well, I guess I was just going to say is that like, I, I think our, our press office is definitely trained well enough now where I could kind of put him by, put him by himself. I, um, was on vacation last week and I left a few jobs for him to do. And I think he did a really good job, but I guess where we're at is we're struggling with, um, keeping up, you know, so our, the volume that we're doing is insane. So he's ready to run the press, but he's, he's slow, you know, not just slow in, actually running the press, which is not really what's important, but more in the setups and teardowns and, and whatnot. So, um, I feel like I can't just like kind of let him free because I know that, that things need to get done. And if they're not about, getting done in the nine to you, five, though? you know, what do you mean? What about me? Like, what are you doing if he's running the press? So right now I would be unloading, but the ideal obviously is to have, get him a, a press assist, you know? Um, 
So then I'm not on the press at all. Definitely is the goal, but the problem still being that, okay, he's running the press and the press assist is doing a good job helping him, but um, we're not going to be able to keep up with what we need to get done, you know? Right. Well, what I was going to bring up and me and Ryan have talked about this a few times and we've done it and I was just kind of confirming it with Ryan. Um, but like last winter we were, I don't know if it was last winter, when it was exactly, but we were really busy and Brian is a really good press operator, but he's the one that it's in our art department. Like he's the one that does all the steps and everything else, but he knows a ton about the press and like he pops out there if we need something, like if somebody's out sick or whatever, like he can run the press. So basically what it boiled down to was that he went out and all he did was he just bounced back and forth between presses all day and just set jobs up. He like right. quickly set it up, did a quick test print. All right, this job's good to go. And then, oh, it was because Randy was out. He's on vacation for like a week or two or whatever it was. And so Brian would set up the gauntlet, get it fully registered, everything good to go. Zach would be printing a job on the sportsman. And then as soon as he finished that job, all he had to do is turn around, go to the gauntlet, start printing. And then yeah. Brian would set up on the sportsman. And then the same thing, he would just, he would literally just do the job of a printer, no setting up, tearing down nothing he was just what are you shirts back and forth are you suggesting that that's what she does so like i'm just saying that if you're press, there and you right. have other things to do what we, if you quickly knock out set up the press let him run it and then you can go about your day doing what else you got to do but then when he's done maybe have you and him tear down and then you set up while he's getting inks or whatever and then he goes right back to printing again that is all well and good but i also want to teach him how to get fast with no i know but i'm just saying up. like right now if it's busy season you're like oh my god what do i do then maybe that is a good alternative for now or you can be like hey this is how i do it this is how it's a little bit faster for me right i just feel like training him on being faster might be better in a slow season than right now when you're like balls to the wall trying to like not pull your hair out is it just a practice thing though like does it just need more practice as far as getting faster i yes but i at the same time i know that like where I'm at is not a reasonable level for, I mean, even if he had been doing it for two years, I think. Um, so I guess as that, that's where I'm struggling is that I know that like he could run the press 40 hours a week and he could do a good job of it, but I know that there's going to be 60 hours of printing that needs to be done, you know? So like that falls back on me really. Um, and I'm already working a gazillion hours. So, um, yeah, we only like, have the one press, so. I, I feel like that's kind of what falls on me as an owner or on Andy is seeing that you have 60 hours worth of work to get done in 40 hours. I don't look at it as like, all right, let's work these guys 60 hours. I look at that as how can I make things more efficient in the shop to where they don't even have to think about it and they can get 60 hours worth of work done in 40 hours because right. pre-registration was faster or the screens were already burned and taped up, ready to go, and the inks were already mixed and the screens were on a cart. So where all they had to do and, was grab it and on press or. And your PRU sounds like you said you're dialing, still dialing it in. Well, maybe that would be a 10 hour difference, you know, in your week. Right. I think it would be a 10 hour difference if it wasn't me setting up. Um, but I'm still really fast with it. So, but I think, you know, so the next piece of, of equipment we purchased, I think probably should be a press, but, um, I mean, obviously we want a CTS, like I want a CTS really bad. Um, I would do that before you get another press. But I don't think that that's going to buy us enough time to get what we need to get done. The one thing it's going to do is it's going to help you set up jobs faster. Right. No, definitely. I mean, I mean I, there is time savings to be had in, in setting jobs up, definitely. But it's not like we're setting up jobs slow right now i'm not no but your your issues with your registration unit might be human error it might be if you get a cts they're all going to be yeah but i'm saying if you get a cts they're all going to be perfectly locked in where they need to be so when they go on press you might get rid of that issue you might be like click 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 okay cool they're registered and then you just save that hour or two or whatever where another press might pick it up so i mean yeah you if you're if you're to the point get another press i'm just saying that you should probably try some pre-press things to get faster before so that I, it makes everything faster. I have an idea. So every time he sets up a job slow, you give him one of those bird fingers, you set it on the, you set it on the <laughs> press and, it, and then if he does it fast, you give him a, 
like a thumbs up hand. That's a, that's a great idea. You know, then he'll be inspired to right. not get the finger. Yeah. Um, <laughs> any, any more questions before we go to shop? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see. I think I had, I had, a, uh, uh, yeah, two more. Um, one is have either of you guys looked at the LTS versus the CTS? Yes, very much. So, because you you both have eye image, or did you just switch to wax, Andy? Andy has wax. Yeah, um, I'm I'm very interested in it, and I had a long conversation with some people this weekend about it. Uh, I just want to make sure it's there. You know what I mean? I want to make sure that it's figured out before I invest in it. My thing isn't necessarily. I could totally get by on what I have, like the the eye image and the the starlight and everything. Like it works, it's fine. But I'm more in the camp of like you and Andy, where I nerd out too hard on things that I want to improve on. Like I want to have a perfect dot. Like the idea of the laser giving me a perfect half tone dot to me is like a boner maker. Like that's I want that. But the other part of it is too, is it's space saving for my dark room because I have a wiener dog shaped building and my dark room is limited. Like I can't make my dark room any bigger than what it is. So what I did a couple months ago is I had custom made aluminum racks made where I could fit another 150 to 200 screens in the same space I had before. So now I have way more screens in there, but I also have, a, you know, a four by six eye image taking up floor space and I have a four by six exposure unit taking up floor space. So I'm like, cool. Well, if I can get the laser that's figured out the thing's like two feet wide. Right. And I could put it up against the wall. I would have room for five more racks in the dark room. You know what I mean? It's like that to me is like, a, I get a better dot. I don't have two units. I don't have ink and I don't have to expose it. I just pop it in and it does the whole thing. So that to me is like, I really want it, but I want to make sure I don't buy it. And I'm like, oh, fuck, they didn't figure this out all the way yet. So that's where I'm at with it. Andy's in another camp. We've had this conversation off the podcast. Well, I think that I I was talking to Kyle, um, sh- shirt con Kyle, and um, I guess Ooh. he was talking about with, uh, <laughs> with L- like just led exposure in general is, is not as good as, um, metal halide. Um, so I guess my only apprehension with getting the LTS would be, is, is it going to expose as well as the metal halide would? We have a starlight now, so we have led and I don't really have any problems with it. Um, but there's a lot of like science behind it as far as like, like light and like wavelengths and like spectrums and everything. Um, but the emulsion that I have is made for like, it's catered toward led and like Andy likes the metal halide and he got an emulsion that works really well for that. And he got rid of issues that he had with reclaim. I don't know why I'm telling Andy's story when he's right here next to me. (laughs) He's Uh, just smiling over there, but Mm. I feel like it's, it's one of those things. It's like what works for you because there's hundreds of variables and you figure out the best way that it works for you or what fits in your shop or whatever. So me personally, I'm excited for the laser and I, I, I want it. Um, but I feel like Andy just got his metal halide, so he's not switching. <laughs> I mean, but you had to have considered it. Do you want to say anything or you just want to sit there and smile at me? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's too many words to say. I think that it's like a whole podcast just on metal halide versus. Well, the funny thing is, is we're thinking about having a podcast about this. Mm. Uh, we are. That we we just talked about. So are you going to have yeah. some, some friendly dueling forces? Because I know that easy way is the easiest way. And I really tried to convince my Saudi guy to change their slogan to Saudi is the Saudiest way. Um <laughs> But they weren't on board with it. So, but anyways, I think you need some some friends versus foes in your conversation because. Well, um, we wanted to we wanted to talk to Chromaline or some emulsion people to yeah have a whole thing room. about emulsion and dark rooms. So, it's in the works. It is in the works. Yeah. What was your second question? 
Um, last question was, so what, what do you, I know that you guys are Monarch, um, bros. Um, but what, so does, does Monarch have like standard shelf inks, like mm-hmm. your kind of your standard colors that you're using or what are you guys using for standard inks? You like stock yes. ink colors? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, get ready for this. I'm, where's my notepad? <laughs> um, I have a prediction because I talked to somebody and I better, I don't know if I can say who that is. Um, a couple people actually. And I think stock colors are going away, will go away for good um, in the near future. In fact, I think that some companies are only have shifted all of their production to white, black and mixing systems. And they're not even making stock colors right now. I won't and say... I think- I won't say who it is, but I heard the same thing at the show this weekend that pretty much if you don't have a mixing system by early 2022, you're kind of fucked. Yeah. And so I don't like that personally because, you know, we use certain stock colors on a daily basis, like a golden yellow. You mentioned a lemon yellow earlier, navy, you know, those kind of colors. We just, it's just so easy to buy. Right in stock because then we don't have to mix it. Right. But uh, as far as the manufacturer is concerned, um, they don't make any more money or less money on that stuff. And so they're, and also it's hard to production, you know, right now with ink, um, pigment, uh, you know, shortages or plasticizer shortages and things like that, that is just way better to focus on white, black and a mixing system. And so I heard that it's probably going to shift to that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, any, kind of... Anyway, with the Monarch system, the, the Vivid system that we have, you can use the colors straight out of the bucket. So you could go through mm-hmm. and Pantone each one of those colors and just pull it out of the bucket and use it as a as an RFU color. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing is we have the mixing system and then we have white, black, and then we have mm-hmm. their bucket yellow and red because those yellow, red, and white, and black, we use the most of. So we have ready to use for those, but you can use the mixing system straight out of the bucket if you want to just be like, oh, I like that royal blue. You right. know, it's not a pigment, straight pigment where you have- You're saying it's a curable color. You could put yeah. it you know, on a t-shirt and it cures, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I already am mixing a lot of my stock colors right now just because the stock colors I have are absolute trash. Um, so like either they don't want to sit on an underbase well, and I, I like everything that we print on an underbase pretty much no one wants a white t-shirt. Um, so, but it's just a time suck to me. I mean, I, I think it will make more sense, I guess, when we have, um, more staff and then also like, maybe we're not buying the, the mixing inks in single gallons or we're buying them in five gallons. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's, like right now, like I have a red that I use. I don't ever use my bucket red unless I'm printing straight on the shirt because the bucket red sucks so bad. Um, hey, we Monarch's really good. Yeah, Monarch kind of, is a opaque bucket red. We're not just saying that because they help us out on the show. We're saying that because it's a really good ink and we actually- Oh, I believe, other people have told me this too, but I just um, spent like two grand on Rio. You don't have to spend so. anything. Just call your rep and be like, hey, send me a color. Like that's exactly what I did is I was skeptical because I used Wolflex for like 10 years. Right. And I was like, hey, I know this is a really good ink and I don't want to switch. But I did in the back of my mind have issues that I was just like, we- we were complacent with because we used them every single day. So like, for Mm -hmm. instance, like 288, like the blue, every time we printed it, we knew it was kind of shitty or we would have to like double hit it or we would have to like print flash print it because it was just thin and shitty. So after I had this like two hour nerd, nerd nerddom conversation with Aaron about Monarch, I was like, dude, honestly, like all this stuff you said was great, but what's really going to change my mind is if you give me a side-by-side comparison on inks. So I was like, he's like, well, give me your shittiest color. Like, what's the one you have most trouble with? So I was like 288. So he he just mixed 288 and sent it to me. And I just printed a big, like, you know, impact font, Monarch. And I, I did his blue and my blue. And his blue blew my blue out of the water. So I literally called him that night and I was like, send me the whole fucking kit. His yeah. blue, blue. His blue, blue. blue. Unintended. His blue, blue, everything. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just was like, all right, like. 
if the blue works this good, then the rest of the colors have to work just as good. And I had tried the whites. I had tried Stark and Legacy, or, or yeah, and Legacy, and uh, Yeti and everything. So I knew those were good, but I just really wanted to know if the mixing system was good. So once we switched over, it was night and day. Like there was a bunch of stuff. It was like around hunting season or something. We were doing like hunter orange on something. And usually that kind of looked like shit too. Right. Um, and then like literally Randy had it in the screen printing with the Wilflex and it kind of didn't look that great. And we were like, all right, we'll probably have to like PFP it or we'll have to do something different, like change the angles or whatever. And I was like, you know what, just take it out of the screen. Let's go ahead and mix it with the Monarch system. And we mixed it with a monarch system, put it in the screen, one pass, and it was like bold, beautiful, like <laughs> opaque ink. And I was like, fuck yeah, this rules. So pretty much from here on out, it's like if we have a print that he brings one of us to test and look at, if I look at that color and I'm like, man, that color doesn't look that great. I'm like, what ink is this? Nine times out of 10, he's like, oh, it's one of the old Wolflex ones, like the right. Epic system. So like, what do you right, do well, with all of the other inks that you've already mixed? We still you know have I mean? all the inks that we mixed. That's what I'm saying. We're using, they're not. I'm not saying Wolflex is shitty. I'm just saying right. like there were certain colors in the system that we knew were troublesome. So like those ones pretty much now are like all replaced with, right. with Monarch colors, but like we still have like, you know, 200 other colors still on the shelf that are Wolflex. Just all we're doing is basically once those are gone, we're just replacing it with the Monarch color. So our PMS system that's on the shelf, we're just using up. And then eventually I didn't want to throw it all away because there's nothing really wrong with it. Um, just a certain couple of bad apples, really. Yeah. Just give it a all try. Right, guys. Just get some samples. It is time for shop hacks. Okay. I got to go first. Mm, no, uh, I think Allison does. <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry. I was thinking quick takes. <laughs> Do you not have your little <laughs> audio thing? Yeah. No. Uh, so, Chad, could you please insert the the audio, the the jingle for us right here? <laughs> okay. So, I was really trying to figure out what our um, what our shop hacks are because I was out of the shop for a week last week, and so you know I'm out of sight, out of mind. But um, I really could be a paid spokesperson for Monday.com. I know, Andy, don't you use it? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes, I, yes, yes, yes. I should just be a Monday.com employee at this point. <laughs> but um, like it being incredible and perfect aside, uh, the automations on it are really awesome. So I don't know if you guys are taking advantage of that. But so we have it set up like for different points of the, the print process to kind of like update the customers on, on where their shirts are. Um, so like when it first gets added into the schedule, it's like, hey, you know, you're on a schedule. You can expect your shirts on this date. Um, and then the next one is once everything's ready to go. So the garments are checked in, the screens are burned, like it's ready to be printed. They get another one kind of being like, Hey, you know, you, we haven't forgotten about you. This is the day that your shirts will be done. And then, um, the last one, when we just hit done on, on monday.com, it sends them the, your shirts are ready to be picked up email, which, um, is awesome. And it really saves us a lot of like people bugging us about when their shirts are going to be done. And people, I, people really like it and they kind of like leave us reviews about it because it's so professional and automated. Um, so I definitely think that that is like worth so much to us. And we, I think that maybe we recently upgraded tiers um, because we had too many, I think you have to pay per automation or whatever, but um, we've had it for at least two years and we were probably paying like $30 a month for it. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely worth it. And we have, uh, inks off and Printavo and I don't like either their calendars. I won't use it. I'm too, I'm too good. I'm too good for them. And I love monday.com. <laughs> You're supposed to do this <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> okay. I like it. I don't know anything about Monday, but it's, I mean, it's just, it's really a, an empty platform and you get to kind of, it, I mean, it's not, I would say it's like a fancy Google sheets maybe. Um, but you can just dial it in exactly how you want it. And we're always kind of making small adjustments to it um, to kind of better suit our workflow um, as things change. So it's just super easy. I mean, it's, it's intuitive and it's color coded pretty. It's easy to look at. Like I can just kind of glance at where I am at with every job on the schedule for the week. And um, 
So I guess the only thing about it though, is that um, Andy, I was listening to you talk on a recent podcast about how you have a lot of soft dates, which really we do too. I mean, most people don't have like a concrete date that they need their shirts in hand, but the, the one kind of drawback to using those automations with the date in it is that, so we just kind of generically set that date two weeks from when they pay their invoice. Um, but now I really have to get those shirts done on that date because they've been getting all these emails about they'll be done. So we kind of do that anyway. Like when we add stuff to the schedule, even if it's standard turnaround, it's still like, there's always a drop dead date on it. It's like the, the last day of turnaround you right. know, is like, yeah, you shouldn't go past this. So I feel like that would still work for me of like, you could always put the last day, but if it ships sooner, they're going to get notified that it ships sooner. Right. Correct? That's, that's always my goal is right. I never, so I never want to print the thing on the day that it's due. So everyone's always happy every single time because it's, right. it's done before that date. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, the automations too, they can work internally. I mean, we have automations set up for us, for example, if, um, you know, the job is approved and all the shirts are here, it moves to ready to print automatically. And that and that can status update for, you know, somebody else who's filtering and views uh, who that, who that information is important to, you know, so a Monday is, we used to be Trello based for years and it just was limiting. And so when we switched to Monday, we were able to do so much more. And uh, we're kind of like you too. Like we kind of, we, we have, um, as we've evolved as a company, we've um, Monday's evolved with us. We're able to get in there and change it and adapt. So it's really great. I love it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it is awesome. Okay. All right. My next one is, okay. So I, I did listen to on another um, episode that you guys were talking about stacking your shirts. Do you stack them smallest to biggest or biggest to smallest? And we absolutely don't do either of those. Um, <laughs> so we like to alternate them kind of by size. So neither of the sizes are next to each other, um, or by color. So a lot of our jobs, the client will get the same, the same design just all across multiple garment colors. So I think that all like kind of skipping sizes makes it super easy, not only for the loader, but also for the catcher at the end of the dryer, because we t- tend to adjust kind of the placement about every two shirts, a little higher, or a little lower, depending on the size. And like, so if we go large, small, extra large, like you are super hyper aware of that size change because it's a, such a difference in size. Right. Um, and then the other thing is, is that it makes it super easy for the person at the end of the dryer. Like they really don't even have to look at the tags because they can, they put it down. They see that those, you know, seams don't line up like something's awry here. Um, so that's super helpful for us too, um, where you're almost not even looking at the the tags. It's so, and then they stay in the same order going, you know, getting onto the cart, getting the first side printed. And then it's in that same exact order when it gets back on the cart, which is nice. The only, I guess the only drawback is that depending on the way that you're boxing them, but we don't always box, you know, smallest to largest. It kind of depends on how many shirts fit in the box. We do use um, like the custom we have, like our own boxes so like if i have 20 smalls and 40 larges like those are probably going to go in the box together because if i have 40 mediums and 40 larges they're not going to fit in the box and i don't really want to split the mediums between two boxes because then someone's going to call me and they're going to be like where are my other 20 mediums guaranteed yeah, yeah. so that is um the way nice. that we do it yeah, yeah and yeah. then uh the last one is about the boxes themselves i see people post all the time about where do you get your custom boxes? Do you print them yourself? Um, a lot of people say Uline, which is like crazy expensive. Um, the other thing to think about with custom boxes is the shipping cost of the box because they take up a lot of space on the truck. Um, so when we started doing them in the beginning, we were using a local box manufacturer. We still are. Um, they're about 45 or 50 minutes north of us. Um, and we would just go pick them up. Uh, Jared has a Tahoe. We could fit like 250 boxes in there. And um, we were buying them blank and we were printing them ourselves on our auto, which uh, was pretty straightforward. We would index the press backwards so it wouldn't shift, like just based on how we had placed the artwork on the box. Um, and we could run the press pretty fast, but it was just tiresome because the boxes are heavy and like the stacks are like outrageously tall because they're so thick. Um, so, 
we did that for a while until we justified the cost of paying for the plates. But once you can pay for those plates, I think we paid $800 for them. It's pennies to get the boxes printed. Yeah. So it's just, it's not worth it for us to, to even waste our time think of, thinking about printing them anymore. And it's, it's been awesome because like, I, you know, I was maybe spending three hours a month printing boxes when I could be printing t-shirts that people ordered from me. So that's been a big um, time save for us. And I want to say that we do use paper tape um, that I know that Dylan is sketched out about, but um, we use this stuff from sticker mule. Um, it's nice. And then Uline has a really awesome dispenser. Like it is like the Cadillac. It's like one yeah, of my favorite things in the shop. Um, I, I it, might still do it at some point. It's electric, maybe. right? No, we, ours, we, we, ours we. isn't. It just has like a handle. And then you, when you release the mm. handle, it kind of like chops it. But it's super easy. I think it's easier than than using a tape gun even because well, you can set the it's precise. Right, yeah. So like I'm using 26 inches every single time. Um, I'm pulling it to that little red line and then I'm letting go and it's it's going to be perfect right. and it's going to be exactly around the box logo the way I want it. Um, and so you just have to make sure that it stays filled with water, but ours stays filled with water for a really long time before it has to get refilled. So, yeah, I, I've, I, that's one of the things I feel like I get asked a ton of from the show is what my box sizes are. Because yeah. I, said oh, I, had like, I had like specific box sizes. You were um, saying that you do yours for like um, saving on shipping, right? Yeah. 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 Cause it's all dimensional weight. So right. one thing we ended up doing recently, we kind of got rid of doing four different box sizes. We ended up getting custom multi-depth boxes. So now instead of me buying four different box sizes and having to have certain quantities to get certain price breaks on certain boxes, now I just order one box and I order, you know, whatever, like a thousand or 2000 at a time. Right. And they're just multi-depth boxes. So I'm still getting the same four boxes. I'm just, it's one box. So the the flaps are scored. So you basically are just like, okay, I need a, you know, I don't remember what the size is right off, but I need the smallest box for like 25 shirts. You just fold it into that mark and then use that one box for that size shirts. And then if you have 50 or a hundred or whatever, you're just folding in the sides to that mark and then whatever. Another thing I want to mention, I haven't tried it yet, but he inspired me and made me want to do it. And it's funny because I have the bag sitting right in front of me is Pyre Press posted something. I don't know if it was like a week ago or two weeks ago or whatever, that he had an order that had, I don't know if it had to overnight or whatever to a band. And he bought a vacuum sealed bag Oh. And vacuum sealed the shirts in the bag so that it was smaller. So I was like, fuck, how many times have we had like a comedian or a band or something in California from New York be like, oh, I need you to overnight something like we have a tour or, you know, I have a show this weekend and we have to overnight like a big box because that's the dimensional weight. That's just what has to fit in that box. So I was like, fuck, I'm going to buy like a like an XL vacuum seal bag. And I'm going to put 100 shirts in the vacuum seal bag and vacuum seal it down. So that way it fits in a smaller box and then the overnight cost is a lot cheaper. Right. Yeah. So they come out all wrinkled though? No, you're still folding them the way you would fold them and put them in a box. You're just sliding them in a bag first and vacuum sealing it. So it shrinks them down, takes all air out. So it's still the same weight, still the same, whatever. It just takes up less room because they're all the air sucked out. So I haven't tried it yet. I will try it and report back, but like he, (laughs) he did it on something. I don't know why he was doing it. If it was the same reasons I'm having, but I was like, fuck, that makes total sense. Cause like I went on Amazon and bought, I don't even know how many it is. It's like 20 vacuum bags per pack. I think they worked out to be like two bucks a piece or whatever it was. Um, but if I'm, if I can save 50 to a hundred dollars on overnighting a box for a $2 bag, like, why not? So I'm going to try it and see how it works. Yeah. I guess my only thought would be is that it's, it's going to be heavier. So the, the hundred shirts in a smaller box definitely makes sense, but you can't put 200 shirts in your 100 shirt box because now it's going to weigh 10,000 pounds. No, but the problem is, is when you have <laughs> like a, like a say hoodies for example so like a hoodie oh, box definitely. when you get a hoodie box from gildan or whatever it is technically dimensional weight it's a 45 to 50 pound box because of the size of the box mm-hmm. but realistically the hoodies only weigh like 20 pounds yeah so you're paying for 50 pounds when it's really only 20 pounds of hoodies 
So if yeah. I could vacuum seal the hoodies and put them in a 50 piece box that is only going to get charged as a 18 to 20 pound box, it's going to save the customer that much more stuff. Like we have customers that we have to ship like 4,000 hoodies to. Not that I want to vacuum seal 4,000 hoodies, but I'm just saying like, realistically, the cost would be way less. You know, like if I had a customer where I was eating the shipping because I really wanted to get the order, I'd vacuum seal all those boxes just to save $2,000 or whatever it's going to cost in shipping. Do freight companies charge by weight or just by volume, really? It's usually like weight and like amount of pallets, like amount of truck space. Right. Um. But yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I just thought about it and wanted to try it. So there it Shop is. Back. Yeah. Um, quick takes. Quick takes. Quick takes. Okay. I got the first one. Yep. Uh, what's one thing you need every morning? Um, I honestly, I get, I don't, I don't want to say coffee because that's what everyone says, but I, I, it's like a, mental thing i don't actually really feel any effects from the caffeine it just tastes delicious and it tastes like the morning so now, even- are you are you a coffee drinker because I, I ran into this this weekend where it's basically like sarah or brian or whatever was in the car and they order something and it's got so much other shit in it that it's not actually coffee anymore you know what i mean they're no. like oh give me like 10 sugars and like half a cup like three cups of cream and like that's that is my sweetener. boyfriend to a t he wants he wants milk with this with a shot of espresso in it basically yeah. but no i mean no, i like them both i don't i don't want anything super sweet but in the morning i just have coffee and oat milk so that's I, i'm right right now i'm in iced but um you know, as the weather turns, you know, I'll, I'll switch back into hot. We got a, we have an espresso at the shop now. No, so, be honest, be honest. Are you going to, as soon as the first leaf falls and hits the ground, are you going to get pumpkin spice? I actually already had pumpkin spice, but Same. okay. Don't be angry at me because, okay. So I like a very good um, production manager. We had a hard week and I went to get donuts on a Friday morning. And I was like, I'm just going to stop by Duncan because I need coffee. And so I don't really like Duncan coffee. I know that that's probably a, an, a fiercely guarded opinion, but we don't, it's not, I know that like in the North Duncan is like the thing, um, but we're, we're Starbucks country down here. So I, um, I didn't really know what to order on the Duncan menu. And I, they put freaking granulated sugar in your, in your iced coffee, which I hate because I don't want sugar cubes in my mouth right, while right. I'm sipping an iced beverage. Um, so I just got the pumpkin, pumpkin spice. cream cold brew because it seemed easy and it was not that bad. So, you know, eight out of 10. So I have Did you not sip had it while you were underneath your live, laugh, love sticker on the wall. I should have, I should have been, but unfortunately I was here screen printing t-shirts and they didn't even, they, I got to the window. I had ordered 50 munchkins and um, they were like, oh, we only have glazed. And I was like, well, this would have been like pertinent information when I was at the window earlier, but I guess glazed it is. So overall Duncan experience that day, four out of 10. Okay. Andy? Best recent read, listen, or watch? Um, this is funny. I actually really didn't have an answer for this uh, until like an hour ago when I got, so I, I don't really, I listen I don't really um, read or watch TV a whole lot. It just, it's not on my priority list, I guess. But um, I haven't read a book in a while. And so I signed up for the Shirt Show um, book club because I was excited to branch out. Um, and I've already read your next book. So um, definitely <laughs> recommend the Bobby Hundreds book. So Well, you um, still have to show up. You can still be part of the club and show up yeah, for the meeting. And talk I, about well, it. I have the book. I like bought the physical copy. So I, I, th I think I'll reread it because I do remember really liking it. And it's been a while since I've read it. So, okay. Well, I'm expecting you on at the end of September in the meeting. Yeah. I was in the last one for a quick second, but then I, I was on vacation and it was time to get our nightly ice cream. So, you know, mm -hmm. priorities. That's reasonable. Right. Right. Well, I love the book so far. I'm in chapter maybe six or seven and I love it. I think it's, it's really good potentially my favorite so far mm. i actually when i read it i made um i made jared read it too because i thought he would like it he, he really likes it as well 
what advice would you give your younger self? Oh, um, I don't know. I really hate that my life has turned out. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I was train wreck. Yeah. I honestly like I dumb luck. Everything worked out. Okay. I mean, even I don't regret going to college for the amount of time I did. I don't regret working at the grocery store for a long time. I moved out of my parents' house when I was 18. That also worked out fine. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I would You're just, just a say, well-rounded human. I, I hate it. I, I hate it. You know, yeah. I have some, like now I feel like I can be sad because right. my, my life is fine. I, I bought a house by myself when I was yeah, 26. You bought a house. Like, you yeah, know? it's, it's, life is okay. Um, maybe that's what I should tell my younger self because I, you know, I'm always like the world's out like to really, get you, but you really need to knock on some wood after that statement, you know? Like, <laughs> I'm really sorry. I, I don't have anything <laughs> wood around me. But. I, got, I got something for you. I got it. Yeah, I got some too. I did it for you. Okay. Yeah. You got a whole bunch of plywood. Thank you guys. I really appreciate yeah, it. We got you. Like that. Double. Allison, what would you be doing if you weren't printing shirts and drinking kombucha? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I really would have probably found some other random job. Like, I think I was thinking about being a bank teller when I was thinking about quitting my screen printing job. I think, I don't think I would would have hired you. (laughs) I brought you back to screen printing. Good. Yeah. Um, So true. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I think this is just my career choice at this point. So um, let me think. Pro- professional answer. What would I have loved to be doing other than this would be probably just like being Aaron Draplin like that. That's probably it. <laughs> just just taking over. <laughs> yeah, just being the queen of the of the graphic design world. But okay. speaking of uh, graphic design world, Bobby Hundreds said the same, his parents said the same thing that your parents said. Cause he's like, Hey, I want to be, I want to go to school and be a graphic designer. And they said, Nope. Yeah. They wanted him to be a, a lawyer or something. Oh, he went to law school. He yeah. Did, yeah. Uh-huh. I'm not, no spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Super spoiled for me. Fuck this book club. Not doing it. <laughs> you don't need an excuse. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your favorite thing to cook? Um, my favorite thing to cook is probably pasta, but what I actually cook a lot of is tacos and macaroni and cheese. So nice. <laughs> Both solid. Do you put mac and cheese in your tacos? Absolutely not. I don't I see I am kind of a macaroni purist. I really don't want I don't want anything touching my macaroni and I don't want anything in my macaroni. So like Are there's you really box macaroni or homemade macaroni and cheese. Well, so it depends. If I'm making it for myself it's box macaroni, but I have the very, um, highly coveted position of official macaroni maker in my family now. So I think that that's a pretty respectable. Do you put crispies on top? I don't cause it's in the crock pot, but I do like a crispy on top. I don't know if my family likes a crispy on top. I like a crispy on not like any bullshit, like breadcrumb crispy. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. You know, Dylan, we may have found the perfect person to make mac and cheese for our meetup at Long Beach because we're going to have mac and cheese and boiled hot dogs. And I'm thinking maybe Allison makes mac and cheese. Maybe, but you can't put the boiled hot dogs in my mac and cheese on, on my watch. You got to do it in a closet in the troll room. Or we'll just something. have, we'll just have beanie Mac and we'll put, mm. we'll put them in there. We're going to make I mean, the, we're going to make the boiled hot dogs in a sink, right? Isn't that what you, <laughs> I think we could just use this. I think we could just use the heat of, Long Beach in water, like just throw hot dogs in water and then let the sun rays warm them. Yeah, nothing like a little bit of salty, salty dog. And right. then everybody gets food poisoning. Right. It'd be great. That's just that's Long Beach. Right. It'll be fine. Um, all right. So what's for dinner tonight? Tacos. Meal prep style. Uh, out of necessity. And I just I recommend it definitely because now all I have to I cook the taco meat last night. So now, I'll, and I made the pico de gallo. So all I got to do tonight is go home, warm up the taco meat, put the, my toppings on my taco, and I'm going to go to bed after that. Mm. Well, that sounds amazing, but not as amazing <laughs> as Shannon from aisle six. Oh, he sent, me, he sent me some of this and I had a little earlier and I think that might just be dinner tonight. I really hope you're joking. You're such Highly a fucking re- liar. Highly recommend <laughs> I want to add, it's not really a quick take, but I want to add that I've been witnessing your running journey 
on your Instagram. How was that going? Horrible. Um, like really bad. So I, I started running maybe two, at least two years ago. You and I was to be doing, doing so good. I was doing really good with it, but then here's this, there's this pesky thing called screen printing and it is like really, it's just been too much for me to kind of maintain both. I mean, I'm here. I, I literally at, at like 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. a lot of times. So like I either need to get up at 3.30 to get on the treadmill, which sometimes I do, or go after work. And the problem with after work is like, you know, I'm on the concrete for too many hours a day. So You're like, hey, you know what would be really good after being on concrete all day is smashing my feet into blacktop. Absolutely. For so miles. Yes. So, and that's, I don't, I don't even remember how I did it. The first time I ever ran 11 miles was after work. Like how, what, what, what possessed me? What sort of weird little running? It's because you're just there? such a go? together human being that you had the ability to do that. Well, and then I kind of like let it go. We, we had gotten really busy and then I, I hurt my foot. I did a half marathon last year and I, I got um, plantar fasciitis. And so, Oh, Andy's going to take over now. I'll back up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, it's not good. It up. <laughs> Settle in. We got another three hours. Tell me, go. tell me about your feet, Andy. I want to know how much do I have to pay you? <laughs> well, you can know. get on his OnlyFans and pay twenty bucks a month for all of his feet pics. <laughs> That's right. But I, it's funny. I have there's a guy here. He runs ultra marathons, and he's a press assistant now, press op, and he sometimes runs home. <laughs> after work yeah like and i th i want to say it's for fun four miles five miles something like that yeah, yeah. works all day load shirts runs home i'm not running unless there's a giant cat running after me yeah, well that's how i felt too but then literally I, I mean the main reason i picked up running is because i thought it was easy and cheap like you put on your shoes and you run out the door and then you realize that you need a pair of shoes that cost 150 dollars and you need a hydration vest and you, you know, you got to eat the little gummies. Chris has been always like trying to get me to like get fit or whatever. And at one point he was like, I don't run, but like, if you want to run, cause I saw the same thing. I was like, I'm fat, like let's run and I'll get like fucking ripped, whatever I'm going to do. You're not going to get ripped, but you will this way. No, I, well in my <laughs> mind, I was like, Oh, I'm exercising. I'm going to be a perfect human being. So yeah. I've like That's fucking true. went out in my fashion and bought like fucking shoes and I got like everything. I was like, I'm going to start running now. And literally the first day I got like half a mile down the road and was like, not for me. <laughs> Turned around, went back home, gave up on running. Yeah, that's, I get it. But so my lately, my, my grind has been, I, in January, I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to like, just deal with work. I'm going to make it work. And so I started running again. I had taken like maybe four or five months off and um, it was going fine. I was doing good. I had trained for several 5Ks that went okay. And then I had already signed up for a half and then I had a 10K and then I, I signed up for my first duathlon, which is like um, run, then bike, then run again. And um, I work took over and it like I just stopped training. So I ran the half with almost no training and nearly died. That was it was five miles on Saturday and then the, the half, which was 13 miles on Sunday. And that was, that was not a good time. And then I had another 10 K that I had signed up for that. I just, I had not ran at all for a month in between the half marathon and the 10 K and somehow I didn't die. And then the duathlon finally, that's where the rubber hit the road or I guess didn't hit the road was that week was two weeks before we moved. And we were just trying to get everything out of the shop that we could because we didn't know how long we were going to be closed because we didn't have permits to occupy the building. And we were just kind of going on a limb of faith moving into the building. You know, we could only get the tech here during this certain window of time. And I was sick and tired of being in the heat. <laughs> so we like we had set a date and we were going to move in. So we were lucky to only be closed the one week that we moved, but we weren't 100% sure that um, we would only be closed the one week. So anyways, that the day of the duathlon, I had, I had not trained at all. And then I ended up working that day. So I just did a real did not start, <laughs> which is a shame, but um, maybe next, maybe next year. I have a 10K Dylan. in October that I haven't trained for. So 
My favorite Carolina? thing about running is watching the YouTube videos of people shitting themselves because they <laughs> don't want to stop and they just keep running. Yeah. Or when asshole people like me put out a table with cups of water on it, but they glue the cups to the table. So when they run by, they can't actually grab the cup. No, you got to get more into the wholesome section where you see like uh, one of the halves I ran on the course, people like stand on the course with full cans of PBR and they just hand it to you when you're on like mile 10, because you really, all you're, you're thirsting for is a PBR at that time. <laughs> and you drink it because someone's giving you free beer. So you got to do it. Mm-hmm. Andy, you were Dylan, saying? I think that your mistake was that you went from zero to running. I think you should have just walked first and then, yes. you know, I love walking. Well, yeah. We'll, we'll do that. Do more of that. Yeah. That's all you really there's need a, to do. There's a really um, nice app called couch to 5k and it, it kind of like adds running walking intervals and it makes it a lot more um e- it just is easier so I you don't like have I to run walk anywhere when i time. was when i was younger i would just put my like you know my discman and my headphones on and i would walk from my parents house to town and it was pretty far and i would always do it like i had zero issues like i could just keep walking i never got like tired i would just keep walking like i feel like i could do that now i could walk forever you just but, need to get a pedometer and get your 50,000 steps a day. I just don't have the time to be like, I'm yeah, going like to walk forest. for three hours. You could be pacing around the shop. Walk, Dylan, walk. And you would Thanks. just okay. walk and then you'd get to... And then California. I'll get to a point and I'll be like, I don't feel like walking anymore. <laughs> and then I'll turn around and go home. <laughs> you got to grow out the beard though. Right. I definitely will. Allison, thanks for talking to us. Can't wait for Print Hustlers. We'll see you there, it sounds like. Maybe yes, in an absolutely. Airbnb. Maybe... Maybe, not. Maybe I'll be sleeping on the street. Who knows? Right. We'll have a couple BLs. You got it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That was BLs with your buds. Right. Right. Exactly. All right. Have a good night. Enjoy your tacos. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me, you guys. Yeah. See you later. Bye.